But you'll have to get me the link on my iPad first. Is it live? Hi, good morning, guys. Good morning. How are you doing today? All right. Uh, I don't know if the streaming has started. Uh, I'm struggling to find my own link. So you'd have to give me a minute. I have to find that link. Dashad, you're, you're going to have to help me with the link. It's not available here. Okay, I think I found it. Morning. <laughs> Good morning. What's up? How do you like my glasses today? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know how do they like? <laughs> do you, do you like? <laughs> do you like that? Thank you very much. <laughs> Ice cream, I love you too. <laughs> Sure, I wish I'll, I'll try and do that. So, how did you guys? How did you guys sleep last night? What is the meaning behind the glasses? Nothing. Yeah, me too. Me too. I I, I also, I haven't slept so well in a while. I slept like a baby last night after long 11 hours of session. I went back. You know, do you remember I told you I was planning to go for a, for a ride last night? So after the class, I waited in the office for 10, 15 minutes. I took my helmet, went down and uh, I looked at my bike and I took out my mobile phone, booked an Uber, went home, <laughs> slept. That's what I'm telling you, you know, ride last night. I, the only ride I did was Uber ride. That, that was my ride last night. I see the dog got excited. <laughs> the dog is like, bow, bow, ready for equity. Okay. Now I'm going to time to show you my real face. All right, so today's alternate for today's alternate for yo yo is uh, today's alternate for yo yo is is chi chi. So today's a chi chi day. Coco, maybe for tomorrow. Today we do. Today we do Chi Chi. Do you like? Do you like Chi Chi?
Right, Rahul, I'll, I'll take care of it. Thank you, man. All right, guys. So early in the morning, I don't want to uh, waste too much of time with pleasantries. I'd like to we'll get started with uh, we'll get started with the business right away. Let me set up a let me set up a background in terms of what are we what can you expect in today's session the official time is 10 a.m where we started to 6 p.m it, it could be a, a little more little less you know depending on uh, how things work out today we're planning to revise two subjects uh, we're going to start the day with equity uh, today is going to be a lot of fun because uh, uh, you know this is what you know, I do you know, with my life. This is this is what I want to do. Probably, I'm extremely passionate about equity. Uh, I don't know if I'm good or bad, but you know, this is what I really love doing. And I do spend a lot of time trying to study companies and kind of think of different frameworks in terms of how I would like to invest. So we would be doing equity. Uh, of course, the focus is going to be exams. Uh, the focus is the target is to make sure that by the end of the day, you guys are comfortable. Okay, I just realized my mic is not connected. Wow. Okay, I think my audio is enough. Can you confirm if the audio has gotten better? I think the audio should improve now. I hope so. Yeah, so I was saying the target is to to make sure that uh, we are comfortable with uh, the equity syllabus of CFA level one by the end of the day. Uh, we will do all the numbers. We will do good numbers. Uh, we will do all the practice questions, but we will also have equal emphasis on theory concepts today. All right, once equity is done, once equity is done, then we need, we need to jump on to derivatives. Now, CFA level one derivatives is not challenging. Uh, I will give you an overview of you know important concepts, but we will again focus a little more on theory in the derivatives class, uh, because my guess is that's what uh, that's what we would have to do on the exams, right? On the exams, CFA level one, my guess is we're doing a lot of derivatives. So with this background, I'm going to get started. The first topic that I would like to start the session today with is my favorite topic in your equity syllabus, which is equity valuation. Okay, and as usual, I'm going to set up some questions for us. Uh, I'm going to set up some questions for us. You're going to practice them. We're going to solve them together. And once we've done this, uh, once we've done this, then we will go and start answering the theory learning outcomes. Okay, so I'm not following the strict sequence of the curriculum, uh, but we would follow the sequence depending on my perceived level of importance of the topic. So let's get started with equity valuation. Okay, more people are worried about my computer charger than my computer itself. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for your concern, guys. Yeah. So, Jala Suru Karu, let us start. Uh, here's your first question of the day. Uh, as I said, I'm going to give you about three to four numbers question. Uh, the first question that I'm going to give you is going to be okay i'll save the pdf also you guys remind me of my granny nine feb anything else i need to do here's your question number one a company has just paid a dividend. Okay, this is the first question for the day. A company has just paid a dividend of $20. 
uh, a company has just paid a dividend of 20. Wow, I had I had no idea about that, Ravinder. Um, equity valuation, that's the subject we're jumping on. So a dividend of 20, you're expecting dividends to grow at the rate of 20% for first two years, then grow at 15% for year three, four, and then grow at 10%, 10% after that forever after that forever okay first question nice and easy very smooth you should be able to handle this very 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 easily cost of equity is going to be 25 percent what i want you to do is i want you to value the stock using a simple gordon growth model okay this is a multi-stage gordon growth model but i don't think this is going to be very challenging get started all right, early in the morning, let's try to extract the most value in the first 60, 90 minutes in the session. Come on, pick up some speed. These are the brownie points on the exam. Like you don't want to miss on something that's so easy. Come on, you have 30 seconds.
Okay. All right, I'm going to solve this. I want you to observe this carefully. Here's how this thing is going to work. The first thing that we want to do here is we want to build a timeline. Uh, these questions are really easy on the exam as long as you know uh, you, you have a structure for approaching them. So this is my time zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, I'm just building a timeline here. Now, the first thing that I want to do is plot the current dividend on my timeline. So time zero, the dividend is 20. Now, year one and two, right? First two years, I'm growing at 20%. So my growth rate is 20%, 20% here. Year three and four, I'll be growing at 15 percentage. So we're looking at 15 percentage. We're looking at 15 percentage here. And uh, I'm going to grow at 10% after that forever. So year five is the first year, you know, when I start getting that perpetual growth rate, right? The growth rate that will go on till infinity. The growth rate, uh, a perpetual growth rate, which is going to be 10 percentage. Now, uh, step number one for us is to basically figure out the amount of dividend for each of the year. I'm finding up my calculator here. Okay, so 20 into 1.02, this is going to be 20.04 into 1.0, did I say 1.02, my mistake, wow, early in the morning, 20 into 1.2, 24 into 1.2, 28.8, into 1.15, 33.12, into 1.15, 38.088, and here into 1.1, 41.89. Okay, so I hope you guys are comfortable in terms of how I have calculated the dividends. Now, please listen to this carefully. This dividend of year five is my first dividend that I've calculated using the perpetual growth rate. So what I want you to do is take the dividend of year five and run your valuation for year four. Okay, so the way you're going to pull that off, it is going to be dividend of year five divided by KE minus G. That's your first formula for the day. This formula is a variation of the formula we saw in yesterday's class on corporate finance. Same, Gordon growth model. So there we use that formula to calculate cost of equity, but the same formula here we're using it to calculate the valuation of the stock. And please remember when you have dividend of year five, and I hope each one of you is listening very carefully because it is important. When you have dividend of year five, you get valuation of year four, okay? So valuation of year four is D5 by K minus G. So let's do that. Uh, the cost of equity is 25 percentage growth rate. The growth rate is 10 percentage. So that is going to be 41.89 divided by 15 percentage. Okay. So I'm going to divide that 41.89 divided by 0.15. I would get a terminal value of 279.312. Now, once you've done this, and this is probably the most important step, okay? What I want you to know, and it's very important, that value of a stock is present value of future dividends, right? In the dividend discount model. So you do not want to take dividend of 20 in your calculations. You use, you use that 20 for calculating future dividend, but you do not use 20 while discounting backwards because it's a past dividend. We've already received it. So you don't want to take that 20. You also do not want to take this 41.89 now. Okay. Do not take this 41.89. Why is that? Because I'm taking my terminal value in year four. Think of it as equivalent to selling the stock. So I sold the stock in year four. I don't get the dividend of year five. Then why did we calculate it? We calculate this 
41.89 so that we could get valuation of 279 okay common mistake that people would do is they will also consider this in their calculation they would go wrong or they would not appreciate that dividend of year 5 gets you valuation of year 4 or they will use 20 in the cash flows if you do any of these mistakes most probably that's one of the wrong options on the exam so these are your cash flows cash flow of year 1 cash flow of year 2 cash flow of year 3 and this is going to be cash flow of year 4 and then you want to plug them in your cash flow function so let's do it second clear work press the cash flow button go to cash flow 1 which is c01 24 enter uh 28.8 enter 33.12 enter and cash flow 4 is going to be a total of these two numbers can you please help me out with that 38.088 Plus two seventy nine point three one two. How much are you getting? I'm getting three one seven point four. Enter. Press the NPV button. Insert your cost of equity. Cost of equity. So twenty five. Enter. Press the NPV button. Press compute. The answer that I am getting, and maybe I'm wrong. I need your help to figure that out. The answer that I am getting here is, is. One eight four point five nine six. Are you guys getting the same answer? Are you guys getting the same answer? Why am I getting? Why am I getting so many different answers here? Chichi. Good. So I hope. I hope you've understood uh, a straightforward multi-stage dividend discount model. I hope you've understood how to do this. I hope you do this right. Um, for some of you who are struggling, I'm going to show you how to do this in the calculator. But see, as I as I told you. as i told you the other day if you struggle with something write it down do it at the end of the day okay today i am sure you will get some time at the end of the day this is my cash flow one this is cash flow two this is cash flow three and this total of these two is going to be my cash flow four and we just want to take a npv of those numbers okay so i hope you're comfortable let's jump on to the next question now so that's that's all the time that we have for dividend discount model i want to show you a few formulas uh, you guys probably know them you guys probably know them but i'm still going to go ahead and show show them those formulas to you so first is free cash flow to the firm okay free cash flow to the firm f c f f free cash flow to the firm uh let's see let's see if we can uh, write down a formula for it so you have to start with net income okay you have to start with net income to your net income you have to add non cash charges okay non cash charges is typically depreciation then you do plus or minus plus or minus working capital investment so these three terms are actually nothing but cfo okay so these three terms these three terms are same as cfo then plus interest into 1 minus t plus or minus fixed capital investment so we have two formulas ready here interest multiplied with 1 minus t and plus and minus fixed capital investment so that's your formula number 1 for free cash flow that's your formula number 2 for free cash flow to the firm 
Okay, now why do we need free cash flow? It's a valuation technique, right? We use free cash flows for valuation purposes. Now these are, you know, this is one of the things that goes on your post-its. You want to write them down and you want to read them a few times till the time you don't internalize them. All right. Now, can there be a, a different variant of the formula? Yes. Uh, when I take total of net income and interest into one minus T, a total of these two items, a total of these two items is EBIT into one minus T. Okay, this number is by the way called NOPAT. So instead of having these two items on the exam, if they start with EBIT, okay, if your starting point is EBIT, then you would say EBIT plus non-cash working capital, fixed capital investment. All right, so that's your uh, third formula, the one that starts with EBIT. There is also a fourth variant of the formula, uh, but a lot of people are confused with that, but I'm still going to show it to you. I don't think it has a high probability of being tested. I mean, I could be wrong, but it's, it's just slightly more complicated. There's a formula that starts with EBITDA. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to do EBITDA into one minus T, EBITDA into one minus T, and then you have to do plus depreciation, assuming that's the only non-cash expense here. So depreciation into T. So when you take total of these two item, a total of these two item is actually equal to, equal to EBIT plus non-cash charges. Okay, so EBIT into one minus T plus non-cash charge, total of these two items is same as total of these four items these two items. So that gives you a new formula. I know it's a little confusing, but let me help you this with the help of an example. You'll find that a little more easier. Okay. So let's, let's do a nice example on this. You'll find uh, this substantially more easier. Let's say we have a firm, okay, which has a, which has a beta of 1.5. It has a risk-free rate of return of 10%. And equity risk premium, I'm giving you ERP directly. Equity risk premium is six. Now the YTM of the bonds uh, of the firm currently is uh, 12 percentage. Tax rate is 30 percentage. Okay. Firm is trying to achieve 60% equity to capital ratio. 60% equity to capital ratio. Now, uh, the in the previous financial year, okay, so at time zero, net income of this firm, net income of this firm was 200. The non-cash charges, primarily made of depreciation, was 100 the firm paid interest interest payment by the firm was 50 investment in working capital investment in working capital was 30 investment investment in investment in fixed capital okay so capex buying machinery you know whatever that was 60 uh, and i think we good enough now based on this information what i want you to calculate is i want you to calculate value of the firm okay calculate value of the firm I'm not saying value the equity, I'm saying value the firm. Now, one trick that you want to know is when you discount, okay, FCFF at WACC, when you discount FCFF at WACC, you get value of firm. And when you discount, when you discount FCFE, at cost of equity, you get value of equity. I hope you guys remember this. Okay. Now, if I do value of firm, okay, if I take the value of firm by using the FCFF approach, and then I say minus 
the value of debt, what I get here is value of equity. So, so FCFF discounted WSCC get value of form. FCFE discounted cost of equity get value of equity. Okay, so observe this carefully now. We have beta, we have data here for you to get cost of equity. We have cost of debt. We have the proportion. You should be able to get WSCC. You should be able to calculate FCFF. I need to give you a perpetual growth rate. A perpetual growth rate of, let us say, uh, six percentage. Now, based on this information, you should be able to value the form. All right. On the exam, the question will not be so large. It could probably be a sub part of what we're doing right now. But this is a comprehensive setup. Let's see if you can do it. Start. I'm giving you a minute. Otherwise, I'm going to do it myself. Come on, guys. Let's make it happen. Don't give up halfway. You know how to do it. Just push yourself a little bit. Think about it. The first step is, of course, back calculation. You have cost of equity. We've done this formula a zillion times. Uh, Vitam is available. Calculate cost of debt. Do a weighted average. That will give you WACC. Figure out the FCFF. I just give you the formula here, FCFF formula. Right, so get the FCFF and then apply a simple garden growth model. It's a very easy question. You should be able to do this comfortably. I 
I'm waiting for a minute or I'm going to do it. Okay, come on, pick up some speed. Don't be lazy. Push yourself a little bit. You know, you, you've already come this far. A little bit of efforts now will go in a long way. You'll probably be doing this, you know, a few days down the line in your exam halls. And you would have a big smile on your face when you know this shows up because you would know how to do it. So make this happen for yourself. Push yourself a little bit. Okay, I'm doing this now. Observe how it is done. Step number one, what we need is cost of equity. Then we need cost of debt. Then we need WACC. Then we calculate FCFF. And then we calculate the value of form. Okay, so these are my steps. Let's calculate. Let's calculate the cost of equity. Cost of equity is simple. Uh, you've done this formula a zillion times. Can you help me out with the formula, please? Cost of equity is going to be equal to. Come on, help me out here. RFR plus 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 beta multiplied with equity risk premium. Now, what's the RFR provided in the question? 10, 1.56. So 10, 1.5 multiplied with 6 percentage. So your cost of equity is 19 percentage. Let's look at cost of debt. Cost of debt, you want to do the effective cost of debt, isn't it? You want to do the effective cost of debt. You have to take the tax benefit. Now you tell me, you tell me if cost of debt is 12 and tax rate is 30, what do you think would be your effective cost of debt? How do you do it? Right? So we take the tax tax benefit. So how are we going to do it? We're going to say 12, 12 into, into one minus 30 percentage. So how much is that going to be? 8.4 percentage. So that's my cost of debt. So we have cost of equity, we have cost of debt. Let's do a WACC calculation. Now, let's back the whole thing up. Uh, cost of equity is 19 percentage. What's the weight we are assigning on cost of equity? Uh, equity, we're targeting 60 percentage, right? So 19 percentage into 60 percentage plus cost of debt 8.4 into 40 percentage. All right. So let's do a let's do a super quick weighted average. Let's see what does it let's see what does it give us. So 0.19 into 0.6 plus bracket open 0 0.084 into 0.4 bracket close equal to I'm getting 14.4. 76 percentage. This number is my WACC, weighted average cost of capital. Now, now WACC is in place. WACC is in place. Uh, let us calculate FCFF, free cash flow to the firm. The first thing that you want to do for free cash flow calculation, think of it in, think of it in the three steps. Okay, step number one. Step number two, step number three. First step for you is to calculate the CFO. Then from your CFO, from your CFO, you have to make two adjustments. One, you have to add back the add back the interest. So you're going to say interest into one minus T. And you're going to deduct 
the capex that the that is done by the firm okay it could be plus or minus but generally it's minus right when your money is going out it's minus money is coming in it's plus so we generally call this as fixed capital investment okay now how do you get cash flow uh, using the indirect method remember this net income plus depreciation so let's call it non cash charges and either a plus or minus working capital why plus or minus uh, if the money is going out minus if the money is coming in plus so let's look at the numbers now what is my net income given in the question let me take a quick screenshot of this put it right next to where we're doing the math so i'm going to put this thing here let's put a micro version here all right so net income net income is 200 so net income is 200 what is my uh, non cash charge depreciation money is not going out but it was deducted so i need to add it back 100 and my investment in working capital investment means the money is going out right that means this number has to be a minus so a minus a minus 30 here so my cfo will come out to be uh, 300 270 so my cash flow from operations is 270 interest to be added after taxes interest is 50 50 into 1 minus t so 1 minus what was the tax rate 30% i guess so 1 minus 30% so this number becomes 35 so we have 35 here fixed capital investment is nothing but the investment that you do in plant machinery building right you getting new capex done 60 money is going out you investing so money is going out so this is going to be negative and that's it job done so let's do a total 270 plus 35 minus 60 let's see how much is that teen ship parts teen ship panche charis don ship panche charis i'm getting 245 please correct me if i go get this wrong 245 is my free cash flow of the firm of time zero okay free cash flow of the firm at time zero why is it time zero because see in the question i told you these are time zero numbers right so time zero we getting a free cash flow of the firm at 245 now you would be happy to know that your golden growth model works everywhere it's not that golden growth model is only for a dividend okay it's not that golden growth model you use only for dividend it's a growing perpetuity model you can use it wherever you like whenever something is growing perpetually you can discount it backwards with golden growth model so here value of firm okay value of firm at time 0 is going to be equal to uh, value of firm at time 0 is equal to free cash flow of the firm at time 0 into 1 plus the growth rate so that we get free cash flow of time 1 divided by wacc not not k divided by wacc minus g divided by wacc minus g all right so let's do that 245 multiplied with 1 plus what is the perpetual growth given here perpetual growth rate given here in the question is 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 6 percentage so 6 percentage divided by what what wscc we calculated we calculated that to be 14.76 so 14.76 minus 6 percentage and let's see what number we get let's see what number we get So two forty five into one point zero six S T O one fourteen point seven six minus six S T O two R C L one divided by R C L two percentage equal to I am getting a number of two nine six four. Can you guys help me out? Is this correct? Are you getting the same answer? Yes. So there you go. that's your free cash flow to the firm okay now will you get such a large question on the exam no you probably get some sub part of it okay you probably get just this just the wscc calculation or you probably get this concept 
discount FCFF at WACC, FCFE at cost of equity. Okay. Or you might have to do this thing. You would get a sub part of it. But if you understood how to do this question right, like the whole thing, then you've understood most of the FCFF business. Now, if you're feeling comfortable, give me a give me our code word for the day. If not, then what do I do? Answer, ask me questions. All right, very cool. Let's let's build some momentum on top of this. Okay, so this is done. This is done. This is done. Let's do. Uh, let's build some momentum on top of this. Now, how would you get FCFE? Okay, so what you do is you start with FCFF. And you deduct two items. Okay, which two items? First, interest, because that, that's what you're going to pay to the bondholder. So you deduct that. And then plus or minus uh, net borrowing. Net borrowing. So if you're borrowing, it's a plus. If you're repaying, it's a minus. For example, you know, for example, let us say if I told you, if I told you that a firm has a FCFF, okay, of 500 and during the year it made interest payment of 100 it made principal principal repayment of 200 okay and let's say tax rate is 30 percent so can we do fcfe from here yes we can okay so you guys help me out please what would be the what would be the fcfe here so we will say FCFE is equal to FCFF is the money available for both the guys, the equity shareholder and the bondholder, right? So FCFE is going to be 500. Now you start with 500. This is the money available for both. Let's deduct interest 100 after tax basis. So one minus 30%. And we are also paying that money. If you're borrowing at see simple logic with cash flows, if you are getting money, plus if you are paying money minus that's as simple as that okay so 500 minus 100 into 1 minus 30 percent minus 200 that's it and and there you go that's your answer so let's see what we get here okay so you get you get uh, 270 no you'd get yeah 230 Easy. That's your FCFE. Now, now one more question. Okay, let's let's play around with this a little bit. Uh, let me. I hope I hope this is this is okay for you, right? I hope you're feeling comfortable. Let me build some momentum on top of this. So let us see if I tell you that there is a firm which has got a FCFE of fifty at time zero. It will grow at the rate of 20% for year one, two, and three, and then grow at the rate of 10% forever after that. Okay. Grow at the rate of 10% forever after that. And let us say cost of equity is uh, again 25%. Can you value the form? Can you value the form from this? Let's do it. Come on. It's already 1052. We'll have to build a little momentum. We have to finish two large subjects here. 
pick up some speed otherwise i'm going to do this for you i'm just going to wait for one minute i want you to give me answer on the chat box the hint is a lot of people think that gordon growth model is only for dividend no sir gordon growth model is a very simple mathematical formula gordon growth model is a mathematical formula it's a growing perpetuity formula you can apply it anywhere okay so you have to do it the same way we did dividend calculation get started fast Thank you, uh, Sami. Value of equity, not form. Come on, guys, pick up some speed. Let's start. I'm solving this. Observe carefully. Let us say that we have uh, time zero. Time one, time two, three, four, five. Follow the same drill. Fifty. Grow them at twenty percent. Twenty percent. Those people who struggled with cash flows earlier, now be a little more observant. Ten percent. This is your perpetual growth rate here. Okay. So let's do this. Fifty into one point two sixty. Bhatter seventy two into one point two would be eighty six point four. Into one point one is ninety five point zero four. Now the Gordon growth model can be applied here also. Okay, so valuation of the business at year equal to F C F. Sorry, valuation of Year three, F F E at year four divided by K E minus. So F C F E is ninety five point zero four divided by K E is twenty five percent. So twenty five percent minus ten percentage. So This divided by point one five, I'm getting a perpetual valuation of six thirty three point six. Okay, now as I told you earlier, don't take this. 
don't take this this is going to be your cash flow one this is going to be your cash flow two the total of these three is going to be your cash flow three i'm hitting the cf button second clear work enter cash flow 272 enter cash flow 3 86.4 enter press the npv button set discount rate to 25 compute npv i made a mistake with cash flow 3 uh, cash flow 3 i forgot wait a minute cash flow let me go to cash flow 3 i forgot the principal value it is 6.4 in cash flow 3 plus 633.6 enter npv compute i'm getting 462.72 is that the correct answer 462.72 are you guys also getting the same that's how you're going to deal with fcfe so deal with fcfe as if it's dividend it doesn't matter in fact let me give you a theory question as a bonus okay when you're using dividend discount model okay when you using you are valuing the company on dividends right when you are using fcfe 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 is nothing but your dividend paying capacity it's a free cash flow with the firm remember this for a theory question easy point to pick up you are valuing the company on you are valuing the company on its dividend paying capacity if the company wants they can pay the entire if the company wants they can pay the entire amount of uh fcfe to you in the form of dividend okay so i'm building momentum now uh, we have to build some speed i need to cover two more numericals with you first this flow chart uh in fact there's just one formula in, instead of doing flow chart i'll just show you one formula there is something called as justified justified leading pe ratio justified leading pe ratio now this is also one of my picks from the reading it's a high probability section the formula that we want to use here is payout ratio divided by ke minus g okay please remember this formula payout ratio divided by ke minus g so on the exam they might give you stuff like this okay so on the exam they will give you something like there is a firm that has just paid there is a firm which has just paid a dividend of let's say 20 rupees it had an earnings of 50 rupees cost of equity uh, 10% a perpetual growth rate of let's say 4% and the current uh, current pe ratio of the firm okay this is a leading pe by the way uh, current pe ratio of the firm is let us say 25 and then they will ask you whether the stock is overvalued okay or whether the stock is undervalued all right so you might have to answer a question like this now how would you do it the first thing that you do uh, on a very simplistic level is you would calculate the uh, justified pe ratio now how would you calculate justified pe ratio let me let me do this for you a payout ratio is equal to a payout ratio is equal to 20 of dividend divided by earnings of 50 now people say how can you do that why don't you use d1 e1 see understand d0 by e0 is going to be same as d1 by e1 payout ratios are assumed to be constant right so 20 divided by 50 is 40 percentage so it doesn't matter doesn't matter if i'm using it's okay to use d0 by e0 it's okay to use d1 by e1 it is not okay to use d0 by e1 that's stupid don't do that but d0 by e0 d1 by e1 use it no problem at all right so 40% payout ratio uh, what is my ke ke is 10 percentage what is my g 6 percentage so what would be my justified ratio 10 what you want to do is you want to look at actual pe 
what is my actual pe it is 25 versus what is my justified pe justified means how much it is worth okay justified pe it's 10 now just think of pe as the price you pay okay because pe is you know the price you pay and then you would conclude that the stock is is overvalued right your conclusion is going to be stock is overvalued have you guys understood this if you have just give me the code word so i know you understood what i'm trying to do with this Oh, sorry, I made a mistake here, did I? Let me change the growth rate to six. You're right, I took the wrong G. Uh, let me, like in my mind, I thought six, I wrote four. Uh, let me change this to six so that I don't have to do the other math. Okay, growth rate, I'm changing to six. Thank you very much. Okay, so now the last concept on valuation and then I have to take you to theory. Last concept on valuation, then I'm going to take you to the theory. Again, this last concept is an important one. Let us say we have uh, two comparable, in fact, we have three comparable businesses. Okay, these are my comparable businesses. The enterprise value, enterprise value of these businesses is 100, 250, 500. The EBITDA level of these businesses, EBITDA level of these businesses is 10. Twelve and a half, and and forty. Now, uh, we have a firm. We have a firm which has a EBITDA level. We have a firm which has a EBITDA level of sixty. The firm has uh, firm is sitting on cash worth worth 40 the firm has market value of debt of market value of debt of let us say uh, 30 and number of shares issued number of shares issued are 10 now based on this information what i want you to do is i want you to find out value per share of the firm the comparative firm okay uh, value per share using using ev by ebitda model as i said it's a high value question there's a good probability this might this is a high value question there's a good probability that this might show up on the exams ev by ebitda model get started guys
on, quick. We just have about, you know, 10 to 15 calculations in uh, level one equity, not too much of variety. We've already done three, four of them. Equity valuation is kind of the main reading here. Are you guys done? Okay, in the interest of time, in the interest of time, I'm going to do this now. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to calculate an average, average industry EV by EBITDA multiple. Okay, an average multiple, average industry EV by EBITDA multiple. How are we going to do that? So we have these three firms, right? So let's do it for form A. Uh, form A has an enterprise value of 100 divided by EBITDA levels of 10. So 100 divided by 10, we're looking at a multiple of 10. Form B, form B has an enterprise value of 250, 250 divided by 12 and a half. Uh, this will come out to be 20. Please correct me if I make a arithmetic mistake. And from C, 500 by 40, 500 by 40. This I think should be 12 and a half. So 12 and a half. Now what I want to do is I want to take an average of these three. So this plus this plus this divided by three. Uh, how much would this be? 42.5, 42.5 divided by three, okay, 14.16, 14.17. This is my average industry multiple, average multiple. Okay, this is how my industry is being valued as of now. This is the average multiple in my industry. Now, once this is done, then we jump on to the firm's A valuation. So enterprise value of our firm, whatever firm we are trying to value, right? Enterprise value of our firm, as per the market multiple, we take our current EBITDA level. What is the EBITDA level? 60. So we say EBITDA level of 60, okay, EBITDA, multiplied with multiple, the average multiple, EV by EBITDA multiple. So EBITDA level is 60 into 14.17. EBITDA level of 60 into 14.17. Let's see how much we get. So 60 into 14.17, getting about 
okay that is the enterprise value now enterprise value is equal to market value of equity plus market value of debt please be alert everyone uh, the, i told you this is you know a very very important concept uh, equity valuation is kind of the core this stuff repeats at level 2 also okay so i want you to know this well market value of equity plus market value of debt minus cash and other uh, if you have a preference share that also plus market value preference shares minus cash and other short term non core investments now i can rewrite the formula and see how i can write this. i want to find out market value of equity right so market value of equity is equal to move everything on the other side enterprise value minus market value of debt okay now we don't have preference shares so i'm not writing that and plus cash correct i can rewrite the formula like this so so what is my what is my enterprise value here my enterprise value is 850.2 what is the market value of debt market value of debt is given to me as 30 so market value of debt is 30 what is the cash given how much cash is the firm sitting on 40 so let's add 40 so the valuation of the firm becomes 860.2 and then what would be the value per share value per share it would be equal to 860.2 divided by number of shares how many shares have we issued 10 10 so you get 86 86.2 that is your final answer now those of you who got this right that's very very impressive good job and those of you who did not i hope you learned how to do this now since this is a little technical i don't mind repeating myself you can ask me question on the chat box i'll mind reply to you yeah decimal mistake 86.02 uh i'm getting a few questions let me answer this uh okay guys see let me repeat this whole process one more time okay i want you to listen to this carefully it's a relative valuation model now what happens in a what happens in a relative what happens in a relative valuation model what happens in a relative valuation model you look at your competitors okay your competitors are getting a bit as of 10 12 and 40 and they are getting these enterprise value think of enterprise value as the market value given to the business by the industry people like you and me we give them the you know we give them the value so what we do is we say okay how many times this is ev right numerator is ev denominator is ebitda so uh, for business a it is getting 10 times of its valuation jitna bhi mera ebitda hai uske 10 guna whatever is my ebitda 10 times of that so i'm getting 10 times of this i'm getting 20 times i'm getting 12 and a half times right these are my competitors so on an average how many times on an average these guys are getting 14.17 okay on an average these guys are getting 14.17 what does it mean it means whatever is my ebitda on an average i can expect a enterprise value of 14.17 now my ebitda is 60 right now we come to our firm 
So my EBITDA is 60. I get a multiplier of 14.17. So my enterprise value becomes 850. Now, what is the formula of enterprise value? Enterprise value is market value of equity plus debt plus preferred stock minus cash. Correct? Can I rewrite the formula? Because see, in this, in this example, we have this number. We have this number. We know that preference shares are zero. We have this number. We have to calculate the, the market value of equity. So I can rewrite the formula like this market value of equity, move all of the number on the, on the other side, enterprise value, uh, market value of debt will become minus. So market value of debt is cash will become a plus. So plus. So then insert the numbers into this formula 850 enterprise value, debt 30, cash 40, I get 860. And then 860 is the total value of equity. When I divide that with number of shares, I get valuation per share. And of course, I made a, I made a mistake with zero. It should be eighty six point zero two. You're right. So thank you for correcting me there. Okay. Are you guys comfortable with this? Uh, can I move on now? Are you feeling comfortable? Do you think this is manageable? Do you think you'll be able to handle this? Yes. No. If you're, if you you know, if you're able to do the questions that I'm giving you here and, uh, or at least if you're able to understand what I'm trying to talk about here, I think your equity paper is going to be easy. Okay. I think you're, you're, you're going to feel, feel very comfortable with these concepts. Yes, Sarah, we divide with the number of shares outstanding. You're right. Why do we subtract cash uh, while calculating enterprise value? Uh, you watch my main video value, which explains the logic behind the formula. You know, this is a crash course, so I don't want to get into the the, the logic. I have a, I have videos on enterprise value. You can look them up. But if you have access to Fintry LMS, uh, you'd find more in-depth information there. Okay. All right. Uh, fair enough. Now. Let's do, let's do theory now. Let's get done with some basic theory concepts. I'm going page number 50 of your juice notes by the way juice notes are available now uh, last night we realized uh, you know there was just massive surge of people trying to buy juice notes on amazon so we got stocked out but uh, my colleagues have fixed their problem now so those of you who need the printed ones okay now, in terms of theory, I'm just going to focus on the key parts, right? Not the basic stuff. Yeah, there is a little bit of internet issue, okay? I know I'm lagging a little bit. It should improve, just be a little patient. Uh, I think things will get all right very soon. Just a minute, guys. Okay. Now my first theory point, uh, can you guys confirm if the audio quality is okay now? Is it better? I've got rid of my video. I hope the audio quality is improved. Is this okay? Guys, can you please confirm if my audio quality is okay now? All right, great. Uh, first important theory concept. Uh, first important theory. Now we're going to attack on the theory of this reading. I want you to listen to this very carefully, please. Uh, everyone, 
when you're doing valuation based on dividends what you have is a minority perspective okay minority perspective means uh, you're a small shareholder you cannot control how the company is going to do business so minority perspective but when using a fcp okay a free cash flow to equity when you're using that model you're using a control perspective control means you know you own you control the company right you own more than 50% you decide how much dividend the company may pay or may not pay so fcfe control perspective dividend minority perspective all right put this into your blood make sure you remember this don't lose out on this easy theory question fcfe control dividend minority now uh, fcfe i have told you this earlier i'm repeating it one more time just because it's so important free cash flow to equity is nothing but the dividend paying capacity of a firm if a firm wants they can pay the entire amount of fcfe in the form of dividend okay so fcfe is your dividend paying capacity moving further with theory uh this formula i have already done with you i hope you are comfortable with this let me zoom this so that so that you can visualize this the justified price earning multiple is calculated as payout rate divided by k minus g all right don't miss out it's an easy form write this down somewhere read this every day in the morning for next few days make sure you know you don't get this thing wrong enterprise value we've already done now let's do a little bit of theory last learning outcome and then we're done with this reading advantages and disadvantages of each category of valuation model the learning outcome m now in the discounted cash flow model uh, discounted cash flow is your dividend discount free cash flow you know all of those in discounted cash flow model uh, look at this point estimates are very sensitive to input value okay estimates are very very sensitive to input value what does it mean especially your growth assumption आपका ग्रोथ एजम्पन थोड़ा सा ऊपर या नीचे हो गया इफ यू ग्रोथ एजम्पन गोज रॉन्ग लिटिल बेट यू नो यू इंस्टेड ऑफ एट यू एंड ऑफ कंपेरिंग नाइन और यू एंड ऑफ कंपेरिंग टेन द वैल्यूएशन इज गोइंग टू चेंज ड्रामेटिकली सो रिमेम्बर दिस इन फ्री कैश फ्लो यू आर एक्सट्रीमली सेंसिटिव टू एजम्पन यू आर एक्सट्रीमली सेंसिटिव टू इनपुट वैल्यू ओके इन अ डिस्काउंटेड कैश फ्लो मॉडल इन अ मल्टीप्लायर मॉडल in a multiplier model what is a multiplier model a price to earning a price to sales a price to cash flow ev by beta all of these are multiplier model in a multiplier model you will not be able to use a price earning ratio if you have a negative denominator what do you mean by negative denominator loss making companies so you cannot use p ratio to loss making companies all right so remember this with the multipliers and asset based model Uh, so remember you cannot use an asset based valuation how do you get asset based valuation it's a it's a value of assets minus liability divided by number of shares right simply book value calculations you should not use asset based valuation when you dealing with intangible assets okay so if you are trying to value an it company please don't use asset based model if you are trying to value a ed education company an edtech company uh don't use asset based valuation right because it doesn't work when the assets are primarily intangible okay and with this this is over so congratulations uh, you know big chunk of the biggest chunk of equity we've been able to finish in the first 90 minutes of the class today do you want to stop for a quick 10 minute break all right so we're going to take another 10 minute break i'm going to put on the timer you have to stay on the link come back in 10 minutes and then we will continue with we'll continue with the next reading now no we've just done one reading of equity we have we have many more <laughs> no no wow 
what level of enthusiasm is that i love that uh, i'm still going to need 10 minutes because i need to figure out my internet issue okay so i need to see what's happening with my internet so please uh 10 minutes be a little patient but i like your enthusiasm thank you for that
Okay. Let's. I'm hoping that internet doesn't trouble us today. I am ready when you are. So this is uh, our landscape. This is where we're trying to navigate through. Valuation is done. Let's go to reading number six now. Okay, let's jump on to market organization and uh, structure. Yeah, now we'll try to do about two to three readings. Okay, so let me fire up juice notes and just first pick up the key number oriented questions that we want to do. Six. Okay. Orders. Margin order. That's it. All right. So two types of numbers, and then rest of the all is going to be theory. Okay. Let's start then. First question. Let us say we have price of a stock at 100 at time zero. At time one, at time one, you feel that stock price will reach 150. Now, initial margin level is uh, is 25 percentage maintenance margin level is 10 percentage now based on based on this information question number one I want you to figure out what would be the margin call price. Second, figure out what would be the return on equity. Third, figure out what is the financial leverage. What is the financial leverage ratio? All right, get started. You have a minute. It's an easy question. It should not be difficult at all. Come on, answer one, two, three sequentially. Let's see who's able to do it first. All right, let's see. Let's see the fastest, fastest people here. Let's see who can handle this first. Come on, guys.
come on let's see who gets the answer first people who are giving me a uh, return on equity of 50% i want you to think through oh more good to see you here i'm surprised someone is giving a negative answer on the chat box like a negative return i'm wondering how i'm wondering how the return is negative but right, here's how, here's how you're supposed to do it i posted this at the wrong place name of this reading is by the way overview all the equity reading names like to me they just you know sound the same even the content is very repetitive in equity so we should be able to do things faster now after this so first uh how do you do the how do you do the margin call price okay guys listen to this margin call price is equal to p0 into 1 minus initial margin divided by 1 minus maintenance margin if you remember this formula it's one easy point on the exam right just a simple formula uh, p0 into 1 minus initial margin 1 minus maintenance margin if you're someone to whom this formula is you know ingrained in uh, comes to you easily great but if you're someone who you know kind of tend to forget formula write it down somewhere right? read it every day in the morning for next few days so p0 100 multiplied with 1 minus initial margin 75 percentage uh, maintenance margin one minus maintenance margin that would be 90 percentage let's see how much let's see how much this thing comes out to be i'm keeping my video closed because uh, there might be some internet issues so 100 into 0.75 divided by 0.9 i'm getting this number as 83.33 if you got this if you got this thing right congratulations to you give me a mass super like super loud code word on the the chat box so first part is out of our way second part the the return on equity okay the return on equity so how do you how do you do return on equity you simply say see it's a it's a 100 dollar stock but i'm investing only 25% to buy it isn't it so if i'm investing only 25% to buy it 25 should be my denominator right because that's what i've invested only 25 and how much money did i make 100 became 150 so my profit was 50 here so profit 50 on an investment of only 25 ignoring the you know ignoring the cost that we have to pay on margin so what is this uh, profitability that's a profit right this is a profit so how much profit have you made here 200 percentage correct you kind of significantly leveraged on your profit now is there a is there other way to look at this yes so for for that i'll come back to question number 2 but let me show you question number 3 first financial leverage which is calculated as value of asset divided by value of equity we also saw in yesterday's dupont class right value of asset by value of equity the value of that share is 100 dollars you're putting in 25 of your own money equity means the money that's going out from your pocket so that's four or or inverse of initial margin so 1 minus 1 minus sorry 1 divided by initial margin so when i so when i do 1 divided by 25% i get four again okay now now if you would see the beauty the you know the beauty of this thing is uh, remember yesterday's dupont formula okay let's connect this with dupont a little bit you would see you would see how beautiful you know the structure is 
remember yesterday we discussed roe is equal to roa into financial leverage like a short horn short hand formula for dupont now what is my roa here look at this 100 rupees stock becoming 50% 100 rupees stock or 100 dollar stock becoming 150 right so my roa roa here is 50 percentage and what is my financial leverage financial leverage is 4 4 and when i multiply this what do i get i still get the same roe of 200 percentage right so you do it this way you do it this way you do it that way you get your answers right i hope you i hope you've understood this i hope you're enjoying this simple easy calculations level 1 you know is is really fun it's there's nothing significantly challenging most of the stuff is manageable and i hope you feeling the same i hope after looking at this i hope you're also finding this reasonably comfortable and easy all right now uh, someone just help me on the someone help me identify on the chat box that i got the name of the reading wrong the name of the reading is market organization not overview i'm sorry so let me let me call this as market organization market organization okay now uh let's build some momentum let's look at some different type of questions now okay so what we have is we have an order book of an exchange we have an order book of exchange this is the only other numerical in this reading and then we just have to do big chunk of theory but this is fun and it's a conceptual theory we have a bid and ask we have an exchanges order book okay now price quantity price quantity price quantity price quantity price quantity price quantity all right look at this carefully now please everyone focus on this price quantity price quantity let us say uh i am willing to buy at a price of 98 One thousand quantity. I'm going to give you best best five bid and best five ask. Ninety seven, two thousand, ninety eight, six point five, five thousand, ninety six, five hundred, and ninety ninety five, ten thousand. So this is the book on the bid side. Let's look at the ask side. One zero one point five, two thousand one zero two one zero two point five, one zero three one zero five, five hundred thousand six hundred five thousand. Okay, now this is the current order book of the exchange. Now here are the questions for you. Question number one. and let me write these questions here on the side so you will get to see everything on one screen question number 1 there's a new trader who's entering the market okay he puts uh, a market order he puts a market order of a uh, purchase market order of purchase of 5000 quantity 5000 quantity you need to figure out what would be his average execution price okay that's one second we have a new trader we have a new trader who comes to the market and he puts a a limit sell order limit sell order at limit sell order at let us say Sell order at at ninety six point five ninety six point five for twenty thousand shares. 
he puts a limit sell order at 96.5 for 20000 shares so what would be an average execution price average execution price okay that's question number 2 and also comment a little bit on quantity question number 3 what is the what is the current market of this order book okay number 4 number 4 if a new uh okay i want you to give me example of orders which would be considered as taking the market okay give me orders which would be considered as an example of taking the market then i want you to give me examples of making a new market making a new market then i also want you to give me examples of behind the market wow this is comprehensive i love this question i i hope one of one of the six shows up right you would be very happy if you are able to get this right uh, six questions extremely comprehensive uh, your whole order book business is kind of done with this so let's let's give ourselves a minute a couple of minutes maybe all right you start doing the math otherwise then i'll show you how to do this and if there's anyone who doesn't know what's happening here, it's fine. You can learn now once I show it to you. Okay, but make an attempt. See if you can handle this yourself. I'm going to wait for a minute or so. Come on guys, start. Do you want me to zoom in on this part? I, I don't know how well this is visible. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. You can take a screenshot of this thing. This is the question number one. Uh, it's a market order. Okay, market order purchase of 5000 quantity. All right. Uh, I hope you've taken a screenshot. Question number two. Question number two, this is now a limit, limit sell order 96.5, 20,000 shares. Then, uh, assuming you have, you have taken a screenshot of the second question, uh, the third, fourth one are easy and this is your order book. If you want, you can take a screenshot of this. This is the order book. All right, start. Uh, Let's see who gets all the six questions right first.
Alert from low battery. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to solve this now. Uh, those of you who were able to do this, that's a great news. If you're not able to do it, it's fine. We're going to do it together. Now, first thing I'm going to do, a screenshot of this. So this is our current order book. Now let's look at the first question. Okay. So we have a new trader. Okay, we have a new trader who's entering the market. And what this person wants to do is he wants to purchase, right? He wants to buy. So if he wants to buy, that means he's going to go down on the ask side, right? These are the current buyers. Ask are the sellers. So this guy is going to go down up to and it's a market order market order means i don't care about the price just give me the quantity right so 2500 3500 4100 and maybe the last 900 will come in here because the quantity is so large so his average price is going to be 101.5 into 2000 divided by 5000 Right, he'll he'll get two thousand quantity at this price, then one zero two into five hundred by five thousand, then plus one zero two point five one zero two point five into thousand divided by five thousand. We have to keep on doing this up to the last part. One zero three into six hundred divided by five thousand. And how much quantity have you already bought? 2,500, 3,500, 4,100. So at the last price, we will buy 900 here, right? So 103.5 into 900 divided by 5,000. What you'd have to do is you'd have to calculate a weighted average. So uh, I don't want to do this now. You just, you just give me the final answer. How much is the weighted average of these numbers? Okay, some people on the chat box are telling me it's 102.29. I'm going to trust that number. I hope this is correct. Uh, just confirm yes, okay, whenever you see this. Now, 10 points out of our way. Now, first question is done. Jump on to second questions. What are we doing next? Next is, again, we're gonna need the order book. We're going to need the order book. So let me just copy this. Okay, this is our order book and let's go to question number two. Question number two is, now we have a investor who's coming in or we have a trader who's coming in and who's giving us a sell order of 96.5. So he wants to sell, but he doesn't want to sell at 96.5. He doesn't want to sell at a price below this. That's the lowest he's willing to sell. So the question is, will he get to sell at 98? Yes. Will he get to sell at 97? Yes. Will he get to sell at 96.5? Yes. Will he get to sell at 96? No, no. And what quantity he wants to sell? 20,000. But he'll be able to execute only the three trades. He'll go down the bid book, but only the first three. Okay. So the average price at which he will get to sell is 98 divided by 1,000. And how, what is this quantity? This quantity is 
uh, 3000, 8000. So 8000 plus 97 into 2000 divided by 8000 plus 96.5 into 5000 divided by 8000. 96.5 divided by 5000 into 8000. Can you please give me an average price here? Can you give me an average price? How much does it come to? 96 point, 96 point 8125. 96.8125. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust that this is this is correct. And the unfilled part of the order, the unfilled part, because he wanted to sell how much? He wanted to sell 12,000. He was able to only sell 8,000. So unfilled order is for what quantity? It is for 12,000 quantity. Good job, guys. So those of you, those of you who got this right, congratulations, you're doing a phenomenal job. You, you know, you're well prepared for this subject. And those of you who did not know how to do this, you know, those of you who did not know how to do this, it's fine. You're learning now. Now you know how to do this. So if this, this shows up on the exam, you will be able to handle it. Okay. Let's uh, let's answer the subsequent ones. All right, let's keep on. Let's let's build on to where we are so far. Uh, let's answer the subsequent theory questions now. So I'm going to have this print out three, four times here. This is the first one. Second one. Okay, let's answer the subsequent questions. Now what we have is we have uh, what is the current market? Okay, so what is the current market? So in your order book, the best bid and the best ask is called the current market. So these two, okay, these two here, this is your current market, the best bid and the best ask. This is your this is your current market. So this is your current market. Okay, so hopefully you're comfortable with this. The best bid price and the best ask price. That's your current market. Second. Second, uh, what is so current market is done? Uh, what would be an example of taking the market? Okay, so what would be an example of taking a market? So if a buyer comes, okay, if a new buyer comes, and he puts a limit by, okay, he, he puts a limit by at the current best ask. Okay, he's just accepting it. You know, he's saying, okay, fine, no problem. I'm willing to buy. So if a buyer comes and he puts a buy order at 10.5, this is called taking the market. You're accepting it, taking the market. In the same way, if a new seller comes, if a new seller comes and he puts a limit sell, he puts a limit sell at 98. If a seller comes and he puts the limit sell at 98, this is also called taking the market. Just accepting, you know, the best bid and the best ask. This is revert, referred to as taking the market. Now, again, those of you getting this right, good job. Those of you did not know it, learn it now. Okay, don't miss out on these easy brownie points on the exam. Let's see what next, what next, what do we have next? Uh, this is done. What would be making a new market? Okay. So if a new buyer comes, okay, if a new buyer comes and he puts a bid, which is better than this, okay, he puts a bid, let's say at about 99. So in the order book, it goes in the order book, it sits above 98, but the transaction doesn't happen. So if a new buyer puts a limit order, of 99 this is called this is called making a new market making a new market and if a new seller comes if a new seller comes and he puts a he puts a limit sell at uh, we want to 
we want to have something that goes above, but the transaction doesn't happen. Let's make it at 101. So limit cell at 101. This would be referred to as this would be referred to as a making a new market. Okay, so I hope you've understood this. Uh, you're making a new market here. You would create a new best bid. You would create a new best ask. And what else? What else? What else? What is behind the market? You know, you just come and post entries here. Like anywhere below this, that's called behind the market. So anywhere you come in the below, you're behind the market. If you come at the bottom, that's far behind the market. So all this area, this is behind the market. Behind the market. All right. Now, if you've understood this, give me our code word. And it's okay to ask questions. I'll probably answer a couple of them if you have any. All right, good job guys. Behind the market is anything behind the market that's anything behind us. You know, behind the best bid and best ask. So anything below the top, top first order is behind the market. Hmm. Okay, what is a, uh, thank you, Derishil. Uh, Derishil gave me an idea. I said, why not also do an example of making the market? So not making a new market, making the market, okay? So basically, if a, a new buyer, if a new buyer comes in at 98, he's just putting a new order at 98, then this is called, this is called making the market. And if a new seller comes zero five, all of these are limit orders, by the way. Okay, so not market orders. If a new seller comes in uh, at 101.5, then again, you're making the market. You're not making a new market. You're just adding quantity to the existing market. So now let me repeat everything in one go. Okay. All the orders on one screen so that maybe you'll understand. I know if you're learning this for the first time, it could be a little confusing. Uh, let me try my best to explain one final time so that all the confusion goes. What are, what type of orders are we looking at? Okay. First order make a making a new market. Okay, then second, second, simply make a market. Third, third, take a market. And fourth, fourth, behind the market, right? These are the four variations we have. So let me just explain on one side of the order book. Okay. Now, please, please listen to, please listen to this carefully. Okay. Uh, box it could be a little distracting just listen to this carefully you get the answer if what would be making a new market if someone got okay and he says that if someone comes and he's willing to buy so Okay, so 
So in the order book, if, if someone comes and he says, and this is a buy order, by the way, this is a buy order. Okay. Uh, yeah, there is an internet issue. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. I know, I know there's an internet issue. I'm waiting for it. I know, I know. Wait a minute, it'll improve. I'm going to repeat. I have to confirm when it gets. <laughs> Just confirm when it gets better. I will repeat. And barking dogs at the same time. The dog is howling now. God knows why is that happening. Uh, has it gotten better? Can you guys? Is it the router problem or is it How is this? Let me check. Guys, can you uh, confirm if this has gotten better? to me mobile connect okay me mobile connect kele tu kai gar te tujha kai karaycha te kahe band karwa ta uh apologies for trouble i have I have switched to my mobile phone internet for a while, hoping that, you know, yesterday there was no one in my office. It was working well. I think it's, I think there are more people in the office now. Maybe that is what is causing this trouble. I think I'm going to Okay. All right. Good, good, good. Uh, I hope. Take the chill pill. Okay, fine. I will take the chill pill if it's available. Better now, better. Good, 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 good. <laughs> Baro Barata, very nice.
Ah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so I I'm so sorry. I I thought that uh, <laughs> it was there. I was talking to myself. <laughs> okay. So one more time. Let me do it one more time. I was saying, okay, and I'm I'm going to repeat. I know there is an audio now, so so let's focus. Okay, everyone. If you if you have a new buy order. okay i'm i'm going to use two three different colors now if you have a new buy order if you have a new buy order at 99 okay it's a buy order at 99 you're making a new market in the same way in the same way in the same way if you put a new buy order if you put a new buy order at the current current level of 99 it's making making a market because you're putting an order at the current market but if you put a sell order okay if you put a sell order here if you put a if you put a sell order here a sell order okay a sell order at the current 98 then this is called taking the market and all the orders which are behind are behind the market that's it this is this is basically what these orders are and now i'm tired doing them just just give me a chee chee whether you understood them or not uh, and then let's get done with it okay so some important theory now okay some important theory so that we feel comfortable with this reading uh there could be you know there could be theory on functions of functions of financial system uh different type of classification of assets i'm not going to spend time on that i'm sure you know what is fixed income what is real estate uh you are comfortable with those areas uh classification of different types of market uh you know a primary market secondary market money market now here uh, in money market there is one thing that's little important so in money market what you want to know is money market is any instrument where we have a security with original maturity of less than 1 year okay so at times they play around with this you know something like this they will say that we have a 30 year bond okay 30 year year bond issued issued 29.5 years ago 30 year bond issued 29.5 years ago so now 30 year bond issued 29.5 years ago you will think that maybe you know maybe it's a money market but no it is still it is still a uh, bond market it is still it is not money market because for money market the original maturity has to be less than 1 year so typically your treasury bills your treasury bills will fall into this segment okay so i hope you're comfortable now let's jump on to the key section in the reading all these are financial intermediaries uh you know nothing fancy there uh, margin call we've already done okay some of the uh, some of the words that you need to know there is something called as a all or nothing order now what is a what is the all or nothing order either you execute the entire quantity or don't do anything either you execute the entire quantity or don't do anything i hope you guys are listening execute everything or don't do anything hidden order you don't show the entire order to the broker okay or you don't show the entire order to the market you hide them iceberg order 
uh, think of Titanic. Like you have a massive, massive, you know, uh, ice mountain under the ocean, but only a small portion is available at the top, right? Visible at the top. So it's like a huge order, but only a small part of it is visible at the at the top. That is referred to as an iceberg order. Okay, so all or nothing, hidden iceberg. Know them. Now there are two types of uh, stop loss orders. I need to do them properly with you. Uh, again, you know, just preparing for a theory question. So let me just show you what those orders are. We have something called as a, we have something called as uh, a stop loss, stop loss by order. And then we have something called as a, uh, a stop loss sell order. Okay, now these are easy orders, right? Now, how to think of a stop loss buy order that, and how to think of a stop loss sell order. So imagine you're a buyer, okay, you're a buyer, you buy shares of some company at, let's say $100, you buy some stocks at $100. What you tell your broker or, you know, what you, what you tell your broker is, you say that if the value falls, you know, if the value falls, then at 70 sell. If the value starts falling down, then at 70 sell. Now stop loss sell at 70. Okay. So typically anyone who is long is going to be the one who would enter into a stop loss sell order. Now what I want you to know, and please listen to this carefully at 70 to sell your order gets converted to a market order. So when there's a strange now noise in the background, I see it's a, it's a pigeon, I guess. Uh, so when the prices are falling, okay. So at 70 sell, it gets converted to a, to a market order. A stop loss buy. Uh, so let's say you, you short sell something at hundred. You're worried that the price will go up. Okay. Let's say at 130, you put in a stop loss buy order. So what you tell your broker is if the price starts going out, then please, please execute a market buy for me. So it's a market order, market order to buy at 130. Now, one question that they might ask you on these two situations is, they will ask you who will use a stop loss buy order. Okay. Who will use a stop loss buy order? And your answer is going to be any, any short seller, a short seller will use a stop loss buy order. Then in the same way, in the same way, they might ask who will use a stop loss sell order. And your answer is going to be anyone who has built a long position on the underlying asset. Okay. So who will use a stop loss buy order short sell who will use a stop loss sell order who will use a stop loss sell order. Uh, anyone who's built a long position. Now, if I had to pick one question from, from this section, here is going to be my choice. We also have something called as a stop loss let's say sell hundred. Okay. Limit, limit 80. A stop loss sell hundred limit 80. Now, what does it mean? Okay. So imagine you take a long position on a stock. Uh, let's say at the price of 150. So at 150, you buy the stock. Now, what are you worried? You're worried that the stock price will fall. Okay. So when the stock price stops, starts falling, you put a limit stop loss to sell at hundred, but sorry, you put a market sell at hundred, but you put a limit of 80. Now, what does it mean is it means once the stock price reaches 80, sorry, once the stock price reaches hundred, your order gets converted into a market order to sell. So you're going to sell in this region. But if it falls below 80, you're not going to sell. You're going to hold on to it because you want to minimize your losses. 
So what they will ask you in situation like this, they will ask you what could be the potential maximum loss. Okay. And the way you want to think of it is even if the stock price falls and it falls dramatically, your broker is not going to sell it below 80. He's just going to stop. He's not going to sell below 80. So the maximum loss you're going to have in this situation is going to be of 70. Have you understood this? Yes, is this clear? Making sense? Are you comfortable now? Alert from calendar. The server responded with an error. All right, good. Uh, let's build some momentum on top of this. Some basic terms here. I'm not going to spend time on them. Uh, this one is important. Shelf registration. I'm going to take a screenshot of this. Uh, put this. In fact, I'm going to take both of these. Let's take all of them. Okay, some basic terms. Maybe you know, easy theory questions. Uh, just factoids, knowledge. Okay. Now, uh, come on, everyone focus. Uh, if you have queries that, you know, needs to be answered, put them in the comments at the end of the day, when the videos are over, see what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to maintain an average speed, you know, so that we finish the target that we, you know, have set for ourselves. But whatever doubts you have, whatever queries you have, put them in the comments at the end of the day, we will try and answer all of them. Okay. So uh, what is a private placement that instead of going to the market, you know, you go to a few market investors, you tell them, you know, I'm, I'm willing to sell the shares. Uh, will you please buy them? Right. That's it. So that's your private placement. Now, uh, what is a shelf registration? So typically every time, every time, uh, you want to do a issue in the public market. Every time you have to do an issue in the public market, you have to do some legal compliances with the regulator. Okay. So I want to issue, let's say uh, $10 million worth of equity today. I have to get a compliance done from the regulator. Then after six months, after six months, I want to do one more issue. I need to do compliance again. What happens in a shelf is I just get uh, some sort of a compliance, a blanket compliance done for next one year. And then I can keep on issuing the shares up to a certain limit that is referred to as a shelf registration. So this is required. If you want to issue securities over time, so you don't have to do the compliance work again and again and again, you kind of, you know, get the compliance job done. Uh, it's on your shelf and then you start issuing securities. What is a drip plan uh, in a drip plan? Uh, very popular in Germany. What they do is that instead of paying you, instead of paying you dividend in cash, they in fact give you new shares of the company. Okay. So if, if you're from India, probably you've, you've not heard of this happening, uh, but it's apparently popular in certain European countries. So let's, let's assume that uh, Fintry issues shares. You guys are Fintry shareholders. Now, this year we made some profit and we would like to pay you dividend in cash, but some shareholder have opted in for drip plan, dividend reinvestment plan. So what we will do is we will not give you cash. Instead, we will give you a few more shares of Fintry, maybe at a discount to market price. Okay. So these type of plans are referred to as the drip plans. Then rights offering. What is the right offering? You guys have Fintry shares. I have decided that we need to raise more money for expansion. 
so we are going to raise uh, more money by going to the markets but 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 the first preference of buying the new shares that i'm issuing would be given to the existing shareholder we say that existing shareholder have a right to buy the new shares issued and that right uh, that right is valuable that right could also be sold in the market okay so it simply means it is a right to buy the new shares at a discount okay these are called as a rights offering okay building on to momentum uh this is also important easy easy theory points let's see what we have here uh three types of market we have a quote driven market order driven market broker market now what is that so in india uh in india when you are trying to buy and sell stuff on exchange what's happening in india most of the securities when you're trying to buy on national stock exchange or bombay stock exchange right uh, the way securities trade there's a bid order book and then there is an ask order book and it's people like you and me you know it's people like you and me who are transacting with each other correct exchange is just a medium and we are transacting with each other there is no middleman in between this is the uh, this is referred to as a order driven market okay but how does a quote driven market work it works a little differently now this is an exchange okay now in exchange in exchange there are few people sitting in here now they don't actually sit in the exchange building but you can think of it that way these guys are called dealers okay so this is a dealer 1 and this is a dealer 2 and let's assume that these are buyers and these are sellers okay so when a buyer wants to buy he can buy them from any of the dealers when a seller wants to sell he can sell them to any of the dealers and these dealers will provide you quotes okay and those quotes would be a bid and ask quote so that is referred to as a quote driven market now in a quote driven market who do we have we have dealers what do dealers do they give us bid and ask prices do how do they buy and sell from us and they sit on the inventory of the assets okay so these are called dealer markets what is the order driven market uh, this is the market where are we have order matching rules right uh, the rules that we did uh, we did different type of rules right sometime back uh, if it's a market order what would be the sequence in which transaction would be executed so there are certain precedence rules and then through these the transactions are executed that's your order market what is a broker market you have to get hold of a broker a skilled broker who's going to execute that trade for you so quote driven order driven brokered market again whatever queries you have please write down those queries in the comments of the video later on you know it's a revision class uh, when i discuss this in my main videos you know we had elaborated discussion of almost 30 minutes on this thing but since it's a crash course we need to finish the content right so uh, so whatever queries you have put them in the in the comments later on but right now i'm just helping people to revise this okay so quote driven order driven and brokered markets i hope most of you are comfortable with this now uh there is a little bit of order matching rules but i don't think we want to spend a lot of time on that so i'm going to uh skip through this part and and we are done with this reading okay so that's that's your reading number 1 which is market organization and structure so we've maintaining a maintaining a healthy speed what we've done so far is Uh, we've done reading number eleven, and we've done reading number six. And with your permission, I will like to start with reading number seven now. Are you guys ready?
Okay. Now, as far as calculations is concerned, right? Uh, there is just one. As as far as calculation is concerned, there is just one major type of calculation, uh, which is actually a pieces of six calculation. But I'm going to convert that into one big example. So, so we do one big example. Uh, Rajiv, can we cut down on unnecessary discussion here, please? Uh, you know, let's let's focus on the content. Then maybe later on we can discuss Facebook and Robinhood. Let let's just focus on the content we're working on right now. One comprehensive example, and then we try to uh, do all type of possible calculations here. So let's say we have uh, three securities uh, into our index. The price of security A at time zero is twenty. This is fifty, and this is one twenty. At time one, the price of this security is thirty. Fifty remains fifty. One twenty has become. One twenty has become. Show this, and it's at this one fifty. The dividend that we've received is zero five zero. Number of shares. Of these securities outstanding in the market, uh, one thousand, five thousand, and ten thousand. Okay, this is the data we have. Now, what could be possible computations on the exam? So, we know that there could be three different types of indexes. Okay, what could be three different types of indexes? We can have a price weighted index. or we could have equal weighted index a price weighted index or we could have equal weighted index or we could have a market cap weighted index correct now within each one of them we can have two variants of the calculation we can have something called as the price return and we can have uh, we can have total return same story here we can have price return we can have total return we can have price return we can have total return right so 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 calculations and more or less more or less this reading is done for us okay so you guys get started it should take you about 3 to 4 minutes to do this uh, otherwise then i will show you how to do it okay get started please everyone
I'm going to solve this for you now. Observe how to do it. It's very simple. First, I'll tell you how to do price weighted. Okay, first we will do the price weighted. Now, those of you who do not know how to do this, uh, you should be able to, you should be able to solve this. If you just listen to this technique carefully in price weighted, and I'm also throwing in a little bit of theory for you. In price weighted, what you're doing is you're building a portfolio where you're doing one stock each. You're building a portfolio where you have one stock each. So what I want you to do is in price return, in price return, in numerator, you take the, uh, you know, take the price at time one. So 30, 50, 150. So 30 plus 50 plus 150. In denominator, the time at price, uh, you know, price zero, 20, 50, 120. So 20, 50 and 120. And then you say minus one. That's it. Okay. So let's see how much is that. Don't share. What? 30, 50, 150, 20, 50, 120. Don't share the section. How much is this? Can you help me out, please? So that would be two three zero divided by one ninety minus one job done twenty one twenty one point zero five percentage. That's the number that I am getting. Uh, please, please correct me if I've gone wrong. But that's my price return. Now, what would be my total return? Okay, what's my total return? So you do the same numerator, does it, okay, same thing, 30, 50 plus 150 divided by 20, 50 plus 120. The only thing that you do extra in the numerator is you add back the dividend. So zero, five, and zero. I'm writing zero just so that you understand later on, right? When you're looking at this, uh, there's just one dividend here, isn't it? Five, that's it. And then minus one, job done. It's so simple, okay? So let's see how much we get here. I just have to add five to my numerator. So don't shape us. This 235 divided by 190 uh, minus one, 23.68. 23.68 percentage. That is your price return. I hope you understood this. Now let's do, uh, let's do the other one, which is uh, equal weighted. Okay, equal weighted and in equal weighted, we do price return. Now in equal weighted price return, what you, you know, what you really need to do is just take an average. So equal weighted is basically you're putting in uh, $1 each. You're putting in the same amount in this portfolio, right? So you're, you're just doing $1 each. So what you want to do is you just want to take a delta of P0 to P1. Okay, so what is my delta here uh, in percentage terms? 20 to 30, that's 50 percentage. Uh, 50, to, 50 to 50 is zero. Okay, and 20 to 150 would be 25 percentage. Agree? So 50, zero, and 25 percentage. Just take a simple arithmetic average of this. Okay, so 50 percentage plus zero plus 25 percentage divided by three end of the story so your first answer becomes how much first answer becomes 25 percentage now uh, if i have to do a total return okay then the only thing that i'll have to do is i'll have to consider the dividend as well so when i consider the dividend here uh, 50 plus 5 55 so the number changes because of the dividend, this number changes to 10%. Everything else is same. So 50 plus 10 plus 25, 50% plus 10% plus 25% divided by three, uh, 85 divided by three, I'm getting 28.33, 28.33. All right, so that's my equal weighted uh, calculation. And then finally market cap weighted, 
okay so market cap will require a little bit of calculation so market cap weighted where you're buying the stocks in the proportion of market cap so you'll have to do market cap at time zero market cap at time zero and market cap at time one and total dividend at time one okay and how are you going to do market cap at time zero and time one so we'll have to multiply them with number of shares so 20 into 1000 is 20000 abc 20 into 1000 is 20000 30 into 1000 is 30000 dividend is zero then 50 into 5000 so that would be how much 20 uh, 250000 so this is 250000 250000 and 25000 okay i'm just multiplying price with the quantity price with the quantity now 120 into uh, 120 into 10000 how much is this going to be so this is going to be 10000 uh, 100000 uh, 1.2 mils please correct me if i make a mistake here this is going to be 1.2 mil right 1.2 million and this is going to be 1.5 million okay now if i want to do a price return if i want to do a price return i need to take, take a total of these numbers so here my total is going to be 1.47 million uh, 1.2 1.45 1.47 million 1.75 1.78 million please cross check please help me with the numbers in case if i'm making an error I'm just trying to do this a little fast so 1.78 divided by 1.47 1.47 minus 1. Uh, let's see how much is this. 1.78 divided by 1.47 minus 1 is 21.08. That's what I'm getting. Uh, that's my price return. If I have to do a total return, then to my 1.78, I will have to also add that, you know, 0. 0.025 you know this dividend uh, in millions of terms divided by 1.47 minus 1 so let's do that so 1.78 plus 0 0.025 divided by 1.47 minus 1 and here i'm getting 22.78 percentage 22.78 percentage and that's it these are my six calculations Ask me. Ask me questions. Tell me if you are comfortable, not comfortable. How many of you got this right, by the way? How many of you got? How many of you got everything right? How many of you got everything right? Good job. Good job, good job, very nice. Good, impressive. You're doing good. That's a good news. And then let's. 
let's get the uh, let's get the theory out of our way for this reading there is there is important theory here okay so we have to make sure that we know those small 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 points uh, i'm going to try and highlight all the important pieces for you i will pick up a speed okay so next 5 minutes if you're listening to me with full concentration more or less your theory is done but uh, you would have to listen to me very very carefully first our index is a hypothetical portfolio do you agree it's not a real portfolio s&p 500 nifty these are not real portfolios these are hypothetical portfolios in price return we just use the price in total return we use price as well as we use dividend or we use income now when you're trying to build an index for yourself when you're trying to build an index for yourself then determine what target you want to focus on right what's your potential target market what kind of weighing mechanism do you want to use do you want to use price weighted equal weighted uh how frequently are you going to rebalance you want to check that and how frequently you are going to reselect the security reexamine the selection within your index these are your calculations uh in the juice notes uh i've given it in a simplified way in terms of how you want to do it uh if you can also look up my videos on youtube there are plenty of them those of you who feel that you know you don't know how to do them we have also put in good examples in the juice notes you should be able to revise through them easily all right what is rebalancing changing the weights what is reconstitution changing the securities so in our example abc if i remove c and add d that's called reconstitution now uh, what are the different types of equity indices i'm going to spend a little time on this okay so this one is important so those people those of you who do not have juice notes uh they at least you get to work with this okay important flow chart first is a, a broad market index you know a good good example here could be something like an s&p 500 or a nifty in india where you kind of giving you know you're talking about overall market right overall market not a particular sector a multi market index would be something like an efa index uh, where you instead of having one market uh, you know you're looking at multiple countries together okay multiple countries in one go then you can have a multi market with index weighting let me give it a star uh, get ready for a theory question you have two three countries right so imagine we have an index which is made of india bangladesh pakistan the question you want to ask yourself how much weight should we give to india how much weight to pakistan how much weight to bangladesh the answer is we can decide that based on some fundamental factor maybe we can take the gdp of three countries take a total of that and then india's gdp divided by the total uh, pakistan's gdp divided by total bangladesh gdp divided by total right we can do it that way so that is your uh multi market index with fundamental weights sectoral indexes pharmaceutical it banking style indexes a value index a growth index so these are your style indexes hope you are comfortable fixed income index again important theory fixed income index in equity a lot of theory questions will show up so we want to target we want to attack we want to attack the theory part as well we want to make sure that we are comfortable with theory okay so fixed income index how are they different number 1 uh, there are too many types there we can classify them based on issuer now who could be issuer it could be corporate like people who are issuing bonds right they could be corporates it could be government it could be anyone collateral secured unsecured coupon coupon zero coupon uh, maturity short term long term 5 year 10 year uh, default risk uh, you know uh, we can say investment grade non investment grade so we have different type of bond uh, inflation protection 
TIPS type of security. Of course, uh, in the fixed income class, you know, we will talk about all of these as well. For your exams, know this: fixed income security universe is much broader than equity universe because you know equity there is just one type, right? Uh, just one type of equity. But in the in the fixed income, there are so many different varieties. There are so many different types. So the universe is substantially more. Universe is substantially more broader. Now, because fixed income security is mature, I hope you're listening to me because this is we are looking at one potential theory question on the exam. Because fixed income security is mature, there's a possibility of having higher turnover. Turnover means security is coming in, going out, coming in, going out. So remember, fixed income is actually not fixed. I mean, if you think of it, because there's such a high turnover in indexes, a fixed income indexes are actually, you know, constantly shifting. This underlying securities are being added; they're being removed. Okay, so high turnover with those securities. Good. Uh, some more theory. Okay, let's do some more theory. Commodity index uh, generally based on future prices. Commodity indexes generally they are based on future prices, not on the spot price. Generally, I'm saying. Real estate index. Uh, in real estate index, there's a word I want you to know. Okay, in real estate index, there's a word. Let me see. I must have put that in the juice note somewhere. Okay, so here's the word. We typically we have some. Okay, now what do you mean by hedonic pricing or adjustments? Uh, I will give you a break very soon if you you know just focus, please, Simran. Uh, guys, hedonic prices means adjustment for quality. Now, what does it mean? So, what does it mean is let's say you buy. uh you buy a nokia phone okay for whatever price it comes for and then you buy a you buy a nokia phone is it better now is it better guys can you Hear me now. Can you confirm? Okay, I'm waiting for you. Let me know. Once it gets better, I'll stop. I'll start speaking again. All right. So what I was saying was, uh, I was saying that hedonic prices means adjustment for quality. so you buy a nokia phone in the first year and in the second year you say you buy an apple phone and then you conclude that phones have become expensive right but that is not true it's not that the phones have become expensive it's not that the phone values have gone up it's just that you have bought a different quality so you want to do those adjustments for quality and those quality adjusted prices that mechanism of adjusting prices for quality we call them as the hedonic pricing all right so hope you are comfortable with this term remember it adjustment for quality very important for real estate because not every real estate is same you know different real estates are built differently so you want to do that adjustment for quality there then uh, hedge fund indexes hedge fund indexes they have a lot of different biases one of the important biases that these guys have is uh the survivorship bias okay now what is a survivorship bias and by the way i these biases in your syllabus right they are very very important okay i would be covering them when we go to the con class because all the biases are listed at one place so it will be easier for me to cover all the biases for you there but i'll just quickly give you what a survivorship bias is Uh, a survivorship bias is essentially that uh, you know let's say uh, it's like this okay <clears throat> let's say that this is uh, 
let's say that this is year 2010 and today we have 20 hedge funds today we have 20 hedge funds now in year 2020 five of them have died you know they have shut down uh, five of them are not in the business anymore because you know they did not do well 15 have survived now what you do is you take this 15 and you look at their performance in the last few years and you say wow hedge funds is such a great investment right the value went up but but what you're doing is you're in a way not being fair because you're not taking data of the five that have not survived correct you're taking data of only the ones which are surviving today so this creates an upward bias it shows return than what true returns are right it shows return then you know what the true returns are and this we call as a survivorship bias which is kind of inbuilt into hedge fund indices and again uh, someone is asking me uh, why what do you mean by equal weighted so generally hedge fund indexes are equal weighted the reason why they're equal weighted is because it's not easy to do any other wing mechanism for hedge funds okay uh, like calculating size of the hedge fund is very difficult because they use very heavy leverages so you never be able to figure out you know what is the market cap of them because of the leverage so it's just easy to simply use an equal weighted index for them and i hope you guys appreciate what equal weighted is if you have five hedge funds you know if you have five hedge funds what you simply need to do is calculate the returns let's say two percent five percent minus three percent six percent twelve percent and just take an arithmetic average that's it that is what an equal weighted is so it kind of makes the whole thing very easy for us okay and i think with this we're done okay there's one more thing that is left and in fact juice notes did have hedonic pricing so hedonic as i said earlier hedonic means adjustment for adjustment for quality okay that is hedonic now one more thing uh, the real estate index real estate index typically hmm, uh, these are appraisal indexes. A real, real estate index is an appraisal index. Okay, what do you mean by appraisal? Appraisal means valuation. Now, because this part is important and this part can also be tested under alternative investment, I'm going to invest about three to four minutes here. Uh, I want you to listen to this carefully so that we get that you know one one easy point on the exam either in equity or in alternatives okay it comes it would come somewhere or the other now uh, please listen to this how it works is imagine i'm trying to build a real estate index okay and what i do is i pick up one uh, one house for example i take a residential property and in quarter one of a year i have an excel file you know, in which I'm doing valuation and my valuation comes out to be 100, okay, in my Excel file. So when I do my Excel file based valuation, I'm doing an appraisal of it, okay. In quarter two, my valuation comes out to be 105. In quarter three, my valuation comes out to be 110. In quarter four, my valuation comes out to be 115. So graphically, you know, my graphically, the data looks like this, okay, from 100 to one zero one one five but but in reality in in reality in market right in market the price was 100 here but it was fluctuating so dramatically it went to 90 here and then it went up to 120 and then eventually it went to 115 so in reality even though the starting points and the end points are same my prices were fluctuating Correct. This is what happens in, in reality in terms of real estate. But this is what happens when indexes are trying to do it. So what happens is when you're using an appraisal based index, they have a smoothing effect. When you're using an appraisal based index, you're doing a valuation by yourself in your Excel file, they have a smoothing effect. And therefore, they show 
they show a sigma sigma means standard deviation which is actually lower than the true sigma lower than the true sigma okay so because they have a smoothing effect they end up showing you a standard deviation which is lower than the true sigma so what is the solution there are statisticians who take these indexes and they try to unsmooth them so for most of the real estate indexes you get two versions you get the appraisal based version and then you get the unsmoothened version and what unsmoothened version means is it kind of tries to bring in more volatility into the model the way real estate behaves in a real life environment what kind of question will come i think the question will come that if you're using an appraisal based index is it showing you the true standard deviation answer is no it is underestimating the true risk it is underestimating the true standard deviation okay i hope you've understood this if you have uh, give me your code word on the box Correct. Right, good. So this reading is out of our way. So we're done with reading six, seven, and eleven. Now, uh, do you want to take a lunch break now? all right so 25 minutes we'll take a 25 minute break uh grab some food i i will do that too and then after the break we'll finish uh, the remaining parts of equity today we are on track i don't think we'll have to extend significantly i think we should be able to uh, we should be able to do this at a, a reasonably comfortable speed guys come back in come back in 25 please everyone
I'm ready when you are. All right, let's start then. Hmm. Next one is uh, efficiency. This is all theory. There are two focal points in the reading. Let me touch base on those points. Did you guys get some food? Did you have your lunch, dinner, breakfast? Did you eat something? Fasting. <laughs> Breaking your fast. Can wrap. All right, Ritesh, good to know. Jezel is on to the dinner. Got it. What time should we be starting derivatives? Uh, we will start at about about fourish. <laughs> Sleepy now. What did, what did I eat? I ate, uh, I generally, like, I avoid having carbs. Uh, I like generally avoid having carbs at any time of the day, but today I ate roti and chutney. It's uh, peanut chutney, which is like a Indian version of peanut butter. And rotis, rotis. Yeah, after the exams, uh, I had a Rolex today. I'm proud of you. So after the after the exams, right? Uh, ah, dumplings and green tea, nice. After after the exams, uh, so see, I'm I'm not much of a party person. So you know, if we if we if we go out together. Um, do you know what a Rolex is though? Uh, no, sir, but I can learn from you if you're willing to teach. Or do you mean not the watch? Yeah, no, I don't know what a Rolex is. Yeah, I was saying, uh, yeah, party, uh, probably not for me. Uh, but if you, if you would like to come for a small trek or a hike, uh, 
Yeah, we can we can do that together. There are plenty of good hikes, plenty of good hikes near <coughs> where I live. <clears throat> or if any one of you is into motorbikes and if you want to go for a go for a nice ride, uh, I'll be more than happy. Not a bicycle. I I didn't mean a bicycle. Okay, I, I meant a motorbike. <laughs> if you're going to fit on fit on some sort of engine uh, on a bicycle, maybe. Yeah, the Manali Ladakh, right? Like in in the Indian. Uh, uh, you know, motorbiking world. That's that's like the Mecca. The that's the place you want to always go to. Like you, uh, from from Manali to Leh, right? I've heard I've heard that's like a really great, uh, really great ride. I haven't done it. I probably probably wouldn't mind exploring. Uh, this year I'll probably do it. I, I don't know. Let's see if I get time. Yeah, that's that's definitely worth doing. I write these days. I'm riding a bobber. I ride a a triumph bobber. I don't have a picture with me. Okay, let's see. But I'm thinking of buying a new one. I'm thinking. I haven't. Finalized it yet? I have a picture. Let me let me see if I can get that on my screen. Yeah, this is my sweetheart. This I took a couple of months ago when I gone for a ride. It has just single seat though. <laughs> There's no. Mm -hmm. Bike is not for couples. <laughs> you want to have a what do you say, kadak? Okay. Let's start. Let's start. Market efficiency. Uh, the authors of this reading. The authors in this reading, right? They they basically uh, what they try to do is so okay. Let me in fact go go a step back. Okay, let's let's understand what market efficiency is. It's it's very simple. Uh, it's it's like you know there's a company. Okay, uh, let's assume there's a company which is 
which comes and makes uh, which comes and makes a great announcement okay it, it comes to the market and it gives a a great news now what you want is you want you want the the price of that stock the like price you know of that stock to reflect that news now this process needs to happen super quick so when this process happens super 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 quick uh, we say that uh, you know we say that it is market efficiency okay i'll give you a recent example i had uh, three days back uh, no i think four or five days back so there's a company in my uh, portfolio okay called uh, testy bytes and these guys made an announcement to the exchange again not an investment recommendation i'm just you know just discussing what happened so what these guys did is they made an announcement to the stock exchanges okay and the announcement that they made is they were planning to do uh, incremental capex so a 20 crore capex and and a 150 crore capex so they were planning to do about 180 crore worth of uh, new capex now their existing gross block is more or less in the same range so what i thought is i thought okay fine you know this is a this is a phenomenal news uh, the capex of the company is going to the assets of the company are going to double in the next 3 years so i want to buy the stock so what happened is uh, i called my broker uh, that time price was so if you see this news came after the market closed okay so if you look at the timing of the news it came at 4 o'clock in the afternoon indian markets close at 3:30 in the afternoon right so this came after market closing so what i did is that time the stock price was something like uh, 11000 and uh, 800 and 860 or something like that so uh, that day in the evening i called my broker and i told him that uh, i i need you to buy more quantity on this stock uh, okay that is my individual trading of what happened I asked him to load up a little more so this guy said fine i'll get it done for you and then i forgot okay i uh, let him do it what this gentleman did is uh, he put an order for uh, he put a limit order for buy at 11880 uh, okay so he put a limit buy order at 11880 or something like that and the next day i think the markets opened the stock opened at uh, 11900 or something and it just went to 13000 okay it never came back to that price of uh, 11880 so so basically uh, the order got never executed uh, you know he never got to buy the quantity the stock price shot up so fast that then he thought it didn't make sense to buy it now so what i what i'm trying to tell you is that news comes right there's a news that's announced and after the first possible opportunity market gets the news gets priced in you know the news came uh, first possible opportunity in the market the news is priced into the stock that is called market efficiency now does it mean indian markets are completely efficient no there is efficiency in certain sections there is not efficiency in certain sections and that's what make the whole uh, efficiency that's what make this whole reading very very exciting okay what authors have done and they've st- they've looked at the markets across the world and they've tried to divide them into certain brackets okay now in terms of what brackets are we looking at so so these uh, these markets could be uh, broken down into let's say uh, broken down into something called as a, a strong form uh, efficiency a semi strong form efficiency and a weak form efficiency okay so broadly what author said is we can divide any market into these three categories now 
each of market is going to have certain characteristics each of the market is going to have certain characteristics what is the characteristics by the way for this reading this table that i'm doing uh, for you is a three star uh, there's a good chance you probably answer a question out of this table so please uh, listen to this carefully now what does the stock price what does the stock price reflect okay uh, what does the stock price really reflect here so price uh, reflects reflects means incorporate in a strong in a i should have written them in a different sequence sorry let me write down the from here it will be easier for you to remember semi strong and let me write down strong form here okay it kind of is up that's why so the price reflects price and volume data okay the price reflects price and volume data in a semi strong market it reflects price and volume data plus all the public information price and volume plus all the public information and in a strong form market okay uh price and volume okay plus public information plus plus uh even private information okay so it's it's kind of crazy uh, i'll give you another example it is there's one more stock in my portfolio uh called uh, tejas networks i spoke about it in yesterday session also right so again it's not an investment recommendation i'm just trying to give you an example and uh, this is so this is uh, uh, if you look at maybe last 5 days okay now in the last 5 i don't i don't generally look at stock price on a daily basis but i'm just trying to give you something now in the last 5 day 5 days the stock price has gone from about 137 to 1 uh, 73 of course the markets are also in that kind of a mood but no such announcement has come from the company they have not uh, got any new business you know nothing nothing has really changed at least there is no announcement so at times i wonder i wonder is i wonder if there are people who have access to information which is not available to outsiders you know so i am an outsider right uh, i i don't if there is something happening in the business till the time it doesn't is it's not announced in the market i don't know till the time the company doesn't come and tell me i don't know what's happening but it looks like uh, you know there are some people who probably know what's happening with the company and therefore a lot of times i see this stock hitting upper circuits or at times you know it's hitting lower circuit it looks like some of the private information is being reflected so it could be i'm not saying that is the case but i'm saying it could be right it could be so uh, in a very theoretical uh, world in a strong form type of market even a private information is reflected into the stock price okay because the rational here is big analysts people are trying to estimate that or guesstimate that and that's why it's it's kind of working out for them now uh what what kind of uh strategy will not work what does not work what kind of a analysis will not work in these markets so uh in a weak form market what will not work in a weak form market what will not work is technical analysis all right so the authors say that if you are living in a weak form market if you living in a weak form market then uh, technical analysis will not work why because technical analysis is a study of price and volume and uh, if it's a study of price and volume of course then uh you know it doesn't make sense right uh, it's not going to work because it's already reflected here uh, in a semi strong market technical analysis will not work even fundamental analysis will not work so all that you and i are doing, right we're dedicating our lives to it we're dedicating important parts of our 
you know valuable time for learning fundamental analysis we today we are learning equity uh, yesterday we did fra that's useless fundamental analysis is useless why because the moment some information is public it's already priced in so as an analyst then i am not going to find undervalued overvalued stocks so fundamental doesn't work and in a semi strong market nothing works you know technical doesn't work fundamental doesn't work if you have some private info you know you're a very smart guy you're doing scuttle but you're going outside the factory you're counting how many trucks are coming in you know you're that kind of a fellow you have information more than what the market has even then that's not going to work nothing is going to work right in a strong form market so what's recommended then then what do you do in situations like this what is recommended what should be your strategy to manage your money so what's what's recommended is in a weak form market what you want to do in a weak form market what you want to do is you want to you want to use an active investment management strategy okay active means you want to hire a cfa chart holder you want to hire an expert you want to give him your money a mutual fund manager and then i believe in your skills because fundamental analysis works in weak form market right only technical doesn't work fundamental works so active strategy is okay but if semi strong market uh, go passive there's no point you know putting your money into a mutual fund go to go the etf route right invest into an index etf done because fund managers are not being not will be able they will not be able to generate you those alphas and the same logic applies here passive so active passive passive that's the recommended game now what my guess is as far as exams is concerned you would probably you know you would probably uh, do a question out of this box that i have built for you so i want you to remember this and remember this well weak form market what does price reflect price and volume price and volume plus public price volume public private what will not work ta ta fa ta fa even private info what's recommended uh, what will work active passive passive okay now i have also seen in curriculum end of the chapter questions they have some very bizarre questions uh, so one is there is also called we have a market which is called a weak form inefficient market not efficient this is weak form efficient right this is efficient efficient market this is semi strong efficient this is strong from efficient so they have something called as a weak form and inefficient especially in one of the end of the chapter questions now this is a market where technical analysis works okay because the markets are weak form inefficient price and volume has important information so therefore uh, technical analysis works in the same way there is also a semi strong strong inefficient market inefficient and this is a market where a fundamental analysis will also work now of course fundamental analysis also works in weak form it works in weak form but in semi strong even uh, inefficient fundamental analysis will work right so you want to remember this small theory tidbits so that's the first half of the reading in the second half of the reading uh, they have discussion on anomalies all right they have discussion on on market anomalies now this anomalies discussion is broken down into two parts so we have a beautiful flow chart in the in the juice notes where we try to summarize this whole thing for you uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to take a screenshot of this and put that into your notes but we've kind of tried like i i feel really proud of the work that we've been able to do with this juice notes so been able to summarize this content really well okay now <clears throat> all these anomalies could be broken down into either a time series 
or into cross sectional. Okay, all the anomalies we are going to break it down either into time series or into cross sectional. Now, sorry. <laughs> now, first question that you may see on the exam would simply be on whether a particular anomaly is a time series or whether a particular anomaly is you know cross sectional. So. How do you know some anomalies time series? Uh, these are the three we have. We have calendar anomalies, we have overreaction anomalies, and we have momentum anomalies. Right now, what would be a <clears throat> what would be a calendar anomaly? That in some month of the year, stock price falls, or in some month of the year, you know, stock price goes up. Okay, something to do with something to do with you know some time of the year now important thing here is we have this very interesting uh, january effect okay especially in the us market we have the january effect now what does it mean in the first 5 days of january stock returns for small caps are higher stock returns for small firms are higher right crazy <laughs> crazy it's it's like if this is true, uh, then maybe in the last week of December, you should buy small caps and you should probably get rid of them on 5th of January. And every year, you know, you've, you've made good money for yourself. Maybe you cost off, you know, your vacations are covered. Hmm. Now, what's the logic for it? Like, why is it happening? So your curriculum is given two reasons. One is they're saying tax loss selling. What does it mean? It means... <clears throat> Uh, in the in the US, the financial year ends in December, right? So, uh, in December, if you are making losses on some stocks, you want to sell them so that you book your losses. Those losses will uh, set off with some other profits. The the losses will the losses will uh, set off with some other uh, profits. And therefore, you'll have to pay less taxes. This is called tax loss harvesting. Okay, remember this word also could be tested. Tax loss harvesting. The other thing is window dressing. And you probably want to know this word also. Window dressing means trying to show something that doesn't exist. So what you do is in December, you sell all the kachra stocks from your portfolio. Uh, kachra means all the dirt stocks, like all the stupid stocks that you buy. And... December end when you have to do the disclosure. Uh, December end when you have to do the disclosure. Uh, you know, uh, you show all the nice stocks. And in the January first week, uh, you buy all the Kachra stocks again. Right? So on December end, uh, when you show your books, your books look clean, your books looks nice. That's called window dressing. Now, what would be an over? So overreaction is where you know, markets have a tendency to uh, overreact to certain bad news. So therefore, what you want to know here is firms with poor stock returns over previous three to five years have better subsequent returns. Okay. Why? Because in the last three, five years, the you know good returns were not given. I think I can think of a nice example here called actual stock price. Uh, it's it's i have a very very uh, unfortunate story with this this stock i was sitting in this stock for a long long time i bought this stock in around 2008 2009 it's a fmcg company and of course uh, you know my thesis was very simple i was like you know people are going to shark people are going to bathe they'll need to twist uh, you know it's a good company it it kind of caters to the mass I was sitting onto the stock, you know, window to about this window. Okay. So I was very patient and I knew that the money will be made. I just have to play out smoothly. Somewhere around this, I got frustrated and I was like, enough is enough. Uh, enough is enough. I need to uh, enough is enough. exit and see what I did. I sat on flattish rally. And I missed on such a beautiful, correct? So what happened to this stock is this stock underperformed for years and years and years. 
it wasn't moving anywhere for a long period of time but it kind of shot up in the last 3 three and a half years or at least last 3 years and people made a lot of money so uh, this is called as an overreaction anomaly like markets will react bad to overreact bad news at times so uh, if you are a contrarian investor where you build contra calls you do opposite of what market is doing maybe you would make money on uh, because of these anomalies then what is a momentum anomaly it's exactly opposite of overreaction when something is going up uh when something is going up it will keep on going up okay and it will keep on going up forever now what could be an example of that uh so again a great example is uh, is a is a great company called uh, it's a nbf yeah. manager of a business family called bajaj and uh, uh, the, if you look at the graph if you look at the graph it's it's kind of crazy uh so so first time i encountered this stock uh, it was around 2014 or 15 i don't remember but somewhere here uh, it was uh, it was recommended to me by one of my students who used to visit their company regularly okay so this guy came to me he said uh, uh, he said sir uh, this is a great stock you know i know the company very well आप आग बन करके ले लो ओके इज लाइक बाय एंड आई नेवर डू दैट ओके सो आई आई वॉज लाइक ओके फाइन लेट मी स्टडी एंड आई आई स्टडीड द स्टॉक एंड आई टोल्ड हिम बॉस इट्स एन ओवर वैल्यूड स्टॉक इट्स ओवर वैल्यूड राइट इट्स इट्स सो एक्सपेंसिव डजन मेक सेंस एंड आई वॉज लाइक यू थिंक इफ यू वॉन्ट टू हैव दिस इन योर पोर्टफोलियो बिकॉज आई थिंक इट्स टू आईजी एंड देन दिस गाय वॉज दैट टाइम इन सी एफ ए लेवल वन then he came to the cf level 2 class maybe in next year he said sir you still have time buy it i was like it's not it's even more expensive now right and then this guy level 3 he was like do you want to buy it i told him maybe i should have bought it earlier but now it's too late now it doesn't make sense and finally i got an entry in stock not at the bottom uh but the miss uh when maybe Going up, going up for a long period of time, and after my, you know, last decades, decade of experience of, you know, I'm a fan of this uh, momentum style. I'm, I'm, I'm not a technical, technical invest, technical guy, but momentum investing for me, uh, you know, is interesting. I mean, that's something that I definitely want to explore in the next few years. So, anyways, uh, that's the time series. now uh let's look at the next two i'm going to keep this door open yeah i'm asking sorry is it better now How about now, guys? Is it better? It'll improve. It'll improve. It just happens once in a while. Okay. So what I was saying is. Uh, yeah i was saying uh, where where should i repeat did you guys get the the bajaj finance story in fact uh, very funny okay couple of uh, guy now i have moved my office right so uh, in pune we like our office has got to a different location and uh, 
and this person now he is a cfo charter holder uh, i have moved very close to his office so so the other day when i was uh, the other day when i was coming to the office i saw him standing on the street so i went to my you know i said hi hello what's happening you know blah 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 we had a little bit of discussion and i told him uh, uh, i told him finally i got into bajaj finance like finally i was able to buy in and now i have built position okay so uh, he and he he was like that's great you know that's great good news uh, but i have <laughs> i have sold it now uh, he said i have sold it now and i was like i was like what uh, and then he said no no i wanted to buy a house so he apparently sold his entire equity portfolio and he bought real estate uh, but but you know it's it's interesting okay this is a great company and i probably want to stay invested for next next 10 odd years uh, you know india's nbfc space is interesting so we'll see how it turns out uh, it's not a investment recommendation just an example cross sectional we have two anomalies here uh, a size and a value effect uh what's what's the size effect small caps outperform large caps is that true uh, i think so i love small caps uh, one of the reason why i feel it's true is because less number of people are generally looking at these type of stocks value effect value stocks outperform growth stocks do i completely believe in it no Uh, it has happened in the previous few decades, but I doubt if if this is playing out currently in the last six seven years. It might. Last decade has been the decade for growth investors, uh, but maybe in the future, you know, maybe in the future, value investing will play out. Uh, a very traditional Ben Graham, uh, you know, or uh, Warren Buffett style of investing has not really been working in the market. At least that's what I feel. Uh, but anyway so this is what your book says value stocks have been outperforming the the growth stocks okay now from an exam perspective this table is uh, this flow chart is super important you want to know this really well learn to distinguish learn to distinguish uh, whether it's a time series anomaly or whether it's a cross sectional anomaly so that's one second learn to distinguish whether it's time series or whether it's a uh, cross sectional anomaly second uh, know what anomaly says what so which you guys probably know now and if you can try and remember which type of uh, which type of anomaly you know which type of market form is being violated for example overreaction will violate the weak form the weak form and these two uh, because these two are technical right they are based on technical indicators so they are violating weak form and these two the size and the value effect uh, they will violate the semi strong form okay uh, so i'm going to make a move from this i'm going to hope you remember it. and then there is a last bit in this reading which is on uh, behavioral finance again uh, if you if you listen to my original lecture i love this area there is a beautiful beautiful book called thinking fast and slow maybe that could be your read after maybe that could be your read after the exams uh, for the timing just remember some of the some of the things number one is loss aversion uh, loss aversion means investors hate losses okay investors hate losses uh, so if there is an investor and you know that investor makes a profit of 10 and if there was a way to measure happiness okay so his happiness will increase by plus 5 but if the same investor gets a loss of 10 then his happiness will decrease by minus 15 the amount of profit or loss is same but the amount of utility gained or lost is you know is significantly different 
this is loss aversion investors hate losses okay um, even even within my family uh, father's portfolio stock i don't want to name it he has a stock that he bought for let's say 100 rupees today it is 20 rupees okay the generally generally uh, you know he like he avoids talking about this uh, but the other day he came to me he said what do you think to do uh, i told him sell it and he was like no 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 uh, i i thought maybe you tell me to average out i said no sell it uh, you know book your losses and deploy whatever money left into something else correct but psychologically booking a loss is very difficult that's why you see a lot of investors you know that's why you would see a lot of investors they keep on averaging out they keep on averaging out even when you know they know that you know the company is going on a slippery road and, and divan housing finance we plenty of example okay so loss aversion investors hate losses uh over confidence you guys know herding everyone wants to go in the same direction every investor wants to go in the same direction uh, uh information cascade is the same thing investors mimic the decision of others conservatism is uh, not reacting to the new information not reacting to the new information and uh, narrow family is just focusing on issues in the isolation okay so with this our market efficiency reading is over i hope you enjoyed the reading it's it's, it's a fun reading uh, plenty of interesting stuff but we have to build momentum now we have to go to reading number 9 which is overview yeah samit that's a great sentence i <laughs> that samit jain spot on <laughs> all right next reading overview the sentence samit wrote on the chat boxes he's saying when an investor incurs losses uh, they become or they become long term investors that's a good one okay practice getting money investing purely yeah that's the way to it uh, i i don't know how to pronounce that name but spot on ak that's why you heard like uh, when some people invest right they use uh, i have this plain place or i have this plain practice you know, so you you would see a lot of people using especially fund managers right uh, hedge fund managers and you know people who do complicated trades uh, they use the word play have you ever heard of it now i like i I've, i've thought about it long and hard in terms of why would they call you know some thesis as a play and the simple reason for that is because you're trying to it look at it like a game and you're trying to keep your emotions out of it that that is actually the right way to do it you know the less the less emotional you are with your investment the better it is and this is this is you know true for you this is true for me all the more for me because like my weakness as an investor is i tend to fall in love with companies and if i if i like the company then i you know just uh, go all in which which is again an emotional bias you don't want to do that Okay. Do you want a quick five minute for breather before we jump on to the next reading? Dashir, we have to do something about internet here.
कैन यू प्लीज कंफर्म इफ आई एम ऑडिबल Am I still audible? My internet is stopped working here, at least on my. Hmm. ये तो है का. Okay. हाँ ये तो ये तो एक्चुअली वाईफाई पूर्ण बंद चला है ना मोबाइल फोन ठीक है थैंक यू राइट ओवरव्यू लेट्स स्टार्ट okay so uh, there is not much in this reading we should be able to do it fast uh, first learning outcome what are common shares we know it uh, different type of voting systems a uh, statutory voting and and cumulative voting now in yesterday's session we did discuss cumulative voting so you should be okay there a callable and a puttable share uh, obviously uh, obviously uh, okay we have some battery left I, I, i'm looking at that thank you so a callable is a little more risky because company can call it back from you a puttable is you know safer because you can put it back to the company uh preference shares they're kind of hybrid between equity and debt uh, you guys know it better so i don't want to spend time on that uh preference shares could be different varieties they could be cumulative non cumulative like if you don't get a dividend in a particular year it will lapse uh they could be participating non participating if a company makes extra profit preference share holders might get to participate in those extra profits uh, they could be convertible non convertible then uh, private equity compared to public equity all right so we have some general general discussion here i'm just going to highlight two or three key points uh one is if you are doing a private equity investment you know that there would be less liquid so that's okay what i like here is what i like here is this that in in private equity uh the management has greater ability to focus on long term prospects okay and this i think is very important okay so i think a good example would be a good example would be uh, let us say there is a company in india called cred okay cred by by kunal shah the it has been circulating in the it has been circulating in those whatsapp messages of lately right and uh, people have been talking about how this this company is burning cash have you has a, have has anyone seen those messages that why cred is a cash burning machine and how things are going wrong so so anyway so i'll give you a quick example it's a private company right and if you if you listen to the interviews of the promoter like i have been following kurnan shah for a while and if you listen to the interview he he knows it's a cash burning company and he is probably planning it to be that way for a few years okay now it might be successful it might not be successful we don't know that but the idea is that they are trying to play a long term game right and the long term game is essentially what you know what cred is trying to do for those of you who do not know the company uh yeah for those of you who do not know the company especially we have some people from outside india here they are trying to build some sort of a platform of platform of uh, the financially uh, affluence mass of people in india 
they're trying to get these people to be on the grid. Okay, so let's say in a very simple language, all those people who are making decent money in India, they would try to be on the grid platform, okay, because of whatever benefits they get. Now, the thing is, once they are able to achieve that, and once credibility is established, maybe there would be different ways of generating revenue, right? Because even Amazon for a long, long, long period of time, uh, you know, was a cash burning machine. And same is the case with a lot of these type of newer age businesses, where it takes it takes a lot of it takes a lot of time for uh, companies to get uh, get the customers to trust them come on the platform platform businesses but once they are on the platform then they convert themselves into money making machines so i don't know if that will happen with credit or not okay i'm not i'm not supporting that but okay now i have to charge just a minute Yeah, but I'm saying uh, because the stock is not listed, you know, because the stock is not listed, the management doesn't care about, you know, short term impact on profitability, they have the ability to take long term decisions. All right, so greater ability to focus on long term prospects, especially for private companies. So remember this point. And then we have multiple types here. Uh, we have venture capital, we have leverage buyouts, management buyouts, we have uh, private investment in public equities. All right, uh, let's focus more. Okay, this is now testable area. Uh, this I'm going to take a screenshot. This I'm going to put in your notes for the session so that when you revise, you have easy access to them. Testable. I want you to look at this carefully. All right, here we go. What is a depository receipt? Very simple. Let's say, you know, uh, let's say an Indian company wants to raise money in the US. Okay. An Indian company wants to raise money in the US. Uh, it can do that with the help of depository receipts. So a DR will represent ownership in a foreign firm and they're traded in the markets of other countries in local market currency. So uh, let's say we'll have a uh, ICICI bank DR. ICICI bank is an Indian bank. It will have a depository receipts in the US bank, in the US bank, okay, uh, in US dollars. Now there are two types here, and this I think could be a potential theory question for you. So you want to know that. If there is a sponsored depository receipt, Okay, if there is a sponsored depository receipts, then investor will have a voting right. But if there is an unsponsored depository receipts, then the voting right generally is with the bank or with the issuing entity. So the bank will have the voting rights. Now, if you're interested in knowing more in depth about this, you'll have to watch my main video where I've kind of explained this, the entire process in, in terms of how this flows. But from an exam perspective, because we're doing a crash course, I want you to remember this. Sponsored from an investor perspective is better. So if, if there's an American investor who's buying a depository receipt, and if he wants to have voting rights, you know, if he wants to have voting rights, he should prefer a sponsored DR as against an unsponsored DR. Okay, then we have plenty of varieties here, right? So we have the ADR, which is the American. Then we have global depository receipts, which are issued outside US and outside the home country. So we're generally looking at Europe here. Okay. Then we have GRS, one stock trading on multiple exchanges. Okay, one stock trading in multiple exchanges across the world. That is called as a GRS. And then we have a BLDR, which is a listed depository receipts, which is nothing but a some sort of a ETF of multiple DR. So all these DRs. They're combined into one product. That's a BLDR. Okay, moving on. Uh, types of ADR. Ideally, you should not be required to remember this, but I've seen curriculum end of the chapter questions. Uh, it's it's stupid, but they test you on it. So we have three types of uh, ADRs here. Okay, 
uh, in terms of regulation the strictest out of these is the level 3 okay so if you want to do a level 3 registration then you have to do a lot of compliances now where do you trade you trade on almost all the american exchanges uh, do you need a sec uh, re uh, registration yes can you raise money in the us yes do you have to pay for listing expenses yes very high if you go level 2 you kind of going midway uh, sec registration is required but you don't raise money there you just list yourself there do you have to pay listing expenses yes and in level 1 you just do the otc okay so some factoids you would want to remember them level 1 level 2 level 3 and then uh, something called as uh, rule 144a which is more of private this is okay if you don't remember this this is fine just remember that level 3 is strictest okay that should do the job for you you have to do everything in level 3 all right uh, moving on moving on i think we're done that's it there's not much in this reading these formulas you guys know uh, return on equity and cost of equity just a quick quick update like a quick view of looking at them is if you have a business with a roe of 25% and if you have a cost of equity of let's say 15% okay so if your roe is more than cost of equity we generally say firm is making economic profit economic profit okay and if you have a roe which is less than cost of equity you're not even generating roe at par with cost of equity then we will say firm is making economic firm is making economic losses economic losses now if you guys have understood this nice and well can you give me the today's code work so that i will close this reading and take us to the next one Okay, for some reason my chat box is not updating. Guys, have you understood this? Okay. All right. My internet is not doing really good here. I I don't know what's happening. okay good 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 to know that fair enough uh ready for the last reading all right then so we've covered we've covered good ground today we through with 6 7 8 9 and we already did 11 early in the morning when we started now we attack the final reading and then we through with equity how how is the internet now is it better
it's not okay how how is it now has it gotten better
Okay. All right. We're almost there. Just one last reading. Plenty of theory. Uh, this reading in general is important. I made uh, everyone in my office uh, disconnect. I made everyone in my office uh, disconnect from the internet. So, so maybe <laughs> maybe that helped. I, I don't know. All right, guys. Uh, I I would like to start. Let's. Is it uh, is it okay now or is it still lagging? All right, I'm, I've disabled my video. Let's hope. I'm going to hope this is okay. All right, then. Uh, why do you need industry analysis? One of the reason, one of the reason why you need industry analysis is industry rotation. So industry rotation as in, uh, you know, for example, uh, I don't know if you guys know it, but today uh, a lot of people are talking about uh, starting at the beginning of a massive commodity cycle, right? Uh, a lot of people are talking about uh, beginning of a large commodity cycle, right? I'm sure you must have, I'm sure you must have heard of them. Uh, these investors who, who's saying that, you know, we are entering into a multi-year, a multi, multi-year phase of uh, copper and steel. And, you know, maybe next five, 10 years, there's a lot of money to be made in this commodity. But, but uh, if you, if you remember five, six years ago, people were scared of commodity stocks, right? So industry rotation means, can you figure out you know, can you figure out which industry to be in and which industry to be not in? You know, for example, just to give you, like, just to give you some perspective, uh, just to give you some perspective, asset management industry in India, you know, the penetration level is so low that in the next decade, the industry will, you know, keep on growing, right? More and more and more money will be uh, pumped into the mutual funds. So, great industry to be in because the penetration levels are so low but if you look at something like you know maybe tea, maybe tea right tea is an industry now in india like in indian market uh, the the penetration of tea is almost 100 percent everyone in india drinks a tea there's a tea tapri you know in the next corner around you so so how are you going to make money in a in a tea business if you know, you have not much of penetration left in the market. Same is the case with biscuits, right? Same is the case with your hair oils, right? These are the, these are the segments of the market, which have fatigued because there is not enough penetration left in the market. So you want to be smart in terms of analyzing which industry to be in and which industry to be out of it. And that is referred to as your industry rotation cycle or industry rotation strategy. Now, what is the performance attribution? This is again important. I want you to know this word. See, uh, let's say we have a some celebrity fund manager. Okay, so let's say we have. Uh, give me give me name of a celebrity fund manager. What name comes to your mind? Uh, 
like a celebrity fund manager india us anyone anyone who who you think is a celebrity fund manager come on give me one or two names all right let's say let's let's say uh, porinju okay so i'm sure you've you've heard of porinju right especially if you're in india i'm sure you've heard of this gentleman uh, and if you're not in india just look look up look up this this fund manager now porinju is you know porinju is popular uh, now let's say porinju this year you know generates an alpha of 3% now what you want to do is you want to ask you want to ask why like why was why was porinju able to generate an alpha right why was he able to generate why was he able to generate that excess return of 3% maybe because you know maybe because he was very smart in uh, picking up the right industry or maybe because he was very stock very smart in picking up the right stocks right i mean see the idea is you can make you can make money because you're picking the right set of uh, sectors or you're picking up the right set of uh, stocks so that is called as a perfect performance attribution understanding why like why portfolio returns are better compared to the benchmark okay uh, so this is use of your industry analysis please remember these two points rotation performance attribution then uh, different type of classification system now here uh, i have seen in curriculum end of the chapter questions they have they ask you to remember this so gips is a four tier classification like we have four layers rgs is 3 and icb is 4 okay so if you just if you just remember russell russell group or oh, some people are very very nice here <laughs> okay if you remember just remember russell global okay and and you say that three year they these are the guys who have three tier classification everyone else has a four tier classification okay moving on what is the difference between commercial and government classification systems uh, government operates like all things government they don't tell you which companies are part of their sectors okay so when government says uh, you know pharmaceutical sector they don't tell you which companies they have included when they're doing pharmaceutical sector they are not very frequent you know they will update data once in a few years so of course the data is outdated then they don't distinguish between small and large company profit or non profit company private or public companies so government is all things government this thing is is important in this reading i'm going to give it two stars okay difference between a government classification and a difference between a government classification and a a private classification okay moving on uh what is the difference between cyclical and non cyclical businesses so uh you know your cyclical businesses generally think of capital goods you know think of capital goods think of sugar think of steel think of even nbfc capital goods most of the commodities a lot of these real estate all of these are cyclical businesses right they are dependent on business cycle important they have high operating leverages important one more time cyclical business will have high operating leverage one more time high operating leverage okay uh, they generally sell non discretionary uh, they generally sell sorry they generally sell discretionary product okay discretionary means you might want to buy them but it's okay if you postpone them for example let us say automobiles right i mean you want to have it but it's not necessary for you to upgrade your car you can probably survive a few years with what you have so so this uh, the purchases can be delayed energy financials technology here non cyclicals are stable companies we can have defensive and then we can have growth companies here moving on what is five factor uh, juice knows themselves have given a five star on this uh, this is a favorite area of many many investors including me uh, i do spend insane amount of time 
you know, trying to learn some of these things. Uh, we can do an example. Let us say uh, the company that I'm currently doing in my financial modeling batch, it's called Loras Labs. Okay, it is a it is a pharmaceutical company. Now, if I want to analyze Loras Labs, uh, let's analyze that in the context of these five players. Okay, number one, uh, rivalry among the existing competition. So what Loras Labs does is it basically makes uh, primarily about 60, 55 to 60 percent of the revenue comes from something called as an ARV drug, antiretroviral. These are the drugs for HIV market, HIV AIDS. Okay. So uh, there are about within that there are two, three different types of drugs. We have a DTE, we have a DTG, we have EFV, first line, second line. But broadly, you can say that there are eight players in the market. Okay. And is there a rivalry between these guys? Yes, there's a reasonable rivalry. Is that a good news? No, you don't want that rivalry because the profit margins are eaten up. Is there a threat of new entry? Uh, again, the answer is yes. Uh, but but most of these drugs, they're generally referred to as uh, high potent drugs. High potent means they're highly chemically reactive. So you need to have very deep, uh, you need to have deep chemistry expertise uh, to be able to manufacture. So threat of entry, yes, but not very easy. All right. So that's some sort of an entry barrier for the business. Is there a threat of substitutes? Uh, yes, there is a threat of substitutes. What is the threat of substitute? Right now, right now, the medicines are the dosage is given in a tablet format for HIV patients. Okay. Now there are talks that in the future, maybe they will come in an injectable format. Okay, so there could be a substitute. Earlier in the HIV world, uh, EFV was considered a very effective medicine, but in the last few years, EFP has been re replaced with uh, DTE and DTG. So, are these substitutes? Yes. Uh, will they eat eat up the business? Maybe. So, is there a threat of substitutes? Yes. Uh, what is the bargaining power of buyers? So, you have to understand who are the buyers. Buyers are uh, three buyers. One is a company called Global Fund. Uh, a lot of money of Global Fund is coming from Gates, Bill Gates Foundation. Then we have uh, another organization called PEFFAR. The money is coming from US President. And then we have uh, LMIC countries, low and middle income countries, right? So customers are not individual HIV patients. Customers are these organizations. Now, do they have significant buyer? Yes, because there are just three big customers. You know, if one of them decide that you know you have to give us discount otherwise we will not buy then uh, you know then it's a risk for the company right so your buyers have a significant bargaining power what is the bargaining power of suppliers so to make the medicine the starting point is something called as a ksm okay then we build something called as an intermediate then we have something called as an api and then using api we build something called as a formulation now, uh, what Loras Labs does is it does all of this by themselves. So the only thing that they have to rely on is KSM. KSM stands for key uh, raw material or key starting material. And this in India, or in, in fact, most of the places in the world comes from China. So are they dependent on Chinese player? Yes. But is it one supplier or multiple suppliers? Multiple suppliers. The bargaining power of the suppliers is relatively lower. Okay, so that's how you can analyze any company anywhere in the world with the context of these Porter's five factors. All right, please remember them for the exams. Uh, for a company which is great, like for a great company, this is what you want. You want a low rivalry. You want a very low uh, threat of entry. You want almost zero substitute if that's possible. You want bargaining power of buyers to be low. You want your buyers to buy whatever you sell at whatever price you sell. And you want bargaining power of suppliers to be very low. If you can find this magic pill, you have set yourself to make a lot of, lot of money in the market. All right, moving on. Uh, are you comfortable with my speed? Guys, can you give me a yes, no? Are you feeling comfortable with, with the speed? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, come on. I want I want each one of you to focus. We are in the last 10, 15 minutes of equity. Equity is almost done. Uh, equity is almost done. We are. Uh, we have to ju do just a couple of big flow charts and then more or less, you know, we get done with this trading. Okay. So let's focus here. Uh, I'm going to keep my camera on for a while. Let's let's hope that uh, let's hope that the internet kind of fixes itself. Now I'm going to focus on the key areas for you here. So we have to look at some of the key points, barriers to entry, industry concentration, industry capacity, and market share stability. Okay. Now, I think I think uh, one of one of you might have a theory question out of what I'm going to show you here, and it's also very intuitive. Like if you have been studying equity markets, probably this comes to you naturally. But if you haven't, then I want you to focus a little bit here. Okay. So uh, let's look at this thing. Industries with product differentiation will have a greater, pri greater pricing power. Uh, an example here, a great example here is uh, Apple. Did you see the prices of those new uh, headphones that they launched? Right. I don't know what is they called. Uh, Apple Apple Pro, like AirPod Pro or something, right? Those uh, in India, I think they priced it about sixty thousand rupees, right? In the US, six seven hundred dollars. Now it's crazy, but why? Why is Apple being able to do that? Because uh, they are competing on product differentiation, right? They're saying that, see, our product is different. And because our product is different, we're going to charge you more. If you want to buy, buy. If you don't want to buy, go and fill in the blanks. Uh, Air Pro mod. Air Pro, AirPods, yeah. Yeah, whatever they call it, right? Uh, yeah. So, so that is called as the product differentiation. If you if there's a product differentiation, you get ability to price your product well. Now, industry capacity. Uh, if there is a if there is a over capacity in the industry, it results into pricing wars. Hmm? Now, if there's an overcapacity, it results into pricing war. Now, what does it mean? Uh, imagine, imagine there are, uh, uh, there have been a lot of industries where overcapacity has resulted into pricing power, I mean, pricing wars. Uh, a great, great example here is again, uh, pharmaceuticals. Like I'm, I'm currently studying pharmaceuticals. So no way, you know, I've reached to a level where I'm, I can say, call myself an expert. I'm probably like a baby in pharma space now. Uh, but what I've learned, and it's it's very interesting, and I did not know that earlier. Uh, but what happens in pharma, right? Uh, and you'd be amazed to know that. And if, if you haven't studied pharma, you'd probably be very intrigued with this. What happens is uh, there are innovator pharma companies, right? Most of these are US and European companies. These are the guys who... These are the guys who do research and they come up with some new medicine, right? Some medicine that solves an issue. Now, uh, typically there is a patent for about 20 years. So for 20 years, uh, these innovator companies make a lot of money because they, they are the only one who can sell that medicine, right? They're the only one who can sell that medicine. Now, I would say 15 to 20 because there is something called as first to five, but I don't want to get too technical about it. Now, let's say when the patent expires, okay? 
when patent expires the innovator drug now becomes a generic drug and generic means any company anywhere in the world can start manufacturing it and of course uh, indians and chinese pharma companies are experts in this business okay indians and chinese we have large companies in india as like sun pharma who do a lot of generic business and then what they do is they look at a blockbuster drug okay a blockbuster drug would be a drug that's so popular there is so much of demand that uh, these guys start manufacturing it and what happens is that suddenly so much of supply hits the market in the first year the price of the drug falls almost by 50% in the first year the price of the drugs will fall by about 50% and it's opposite in the pharma sector in pharma sector every year we have something called as a price erosion okay so uh, especially in the generic space every year more and more companies try and manufacture the same product and then that oversupply results into a decrease in the price over a period of time so if you come across an industry where there is an over capacity over capacity means company are manufacturing more than what's needed is going to result into pricing wars then this is another sentence uh, again i want you to know this non physical capacity can be relocated more quickly non physical capacity can be relocated more quickly then physical capacity all right what could be an example here and great example here would be non physical capacity uh, would be let's say human power right the employees so imagine you know imagine i am an it company and uh, you know i have recruited 100 people for one particular client okay and let's say that suddenly my competitors have started competing for getting that client one business i can always move my people to work in some other project right so i can get client two i can get client three so if you have a non physical capacity it's easier to move rather than a physical capacity like a factory hmm next one switching cost switching cost is uh, the cost that a customer will incur when he needs to move from one product to another uh an example for me that's applicable here is uh, the mac os versus windows okay so in my in my previous life when i was in corporate uh i had to use a lot of excel and you know our companies had provided us with windows machine so i used windows for a while so the first time when i moved to mac uh it took me about a week to start feeling comfortable in terms of how to use a macbook it's a totally different experience but now you know last 10 years i have been using mac now i don't want to move to windows okay for me the switching cost is about a week right we getting comfortable because of the so many softwares that i have to use while i'm teaching so i don't want to do that so my switching cost is the time that i invest right one week so even if macs are expensive you know their parts are expensive you know in india the service is shitty but then there's no choice because the switching cost is very high right that's what you call by that's what you mean by switching cost now if the switching cost is very high you generally see that market shares would be very stable okay but if it's very easy for people to move from you know one product to another then you would see that market shares are constantly moving market shares are always going up and down up and down up and down so if as an investor again you want to look at those industries where switching cost is very 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 high i hope you have understood this and there are numerous examples but again we are studying for exams so i'm being a little fast here okay and then uh this is okay last two flow charts but this is my seven star pick of the day seven star i'm giving this a seven star uh i in my individual opinion i feel that this is extremely important i'm going to put this in your class notes
one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, I feel that this one is an important one. Now, uh, what is this? This is talking about different stages through which a company goes. Okay, this particular learning outcome. Now, uh, different stages through which a company grows. The first thing that I want you to remember is just the sequence. Okay, embryonic, growth, shakeout, mature, and decline. So, embryonic, growth, shakeout, mature, and decline. You would have to remember the sequence. Uh, remember that, remember that shakeout falls between growth and mature. Okay, shakeout falls between growth and Elon goes to space, moving downwards. <laughs> okay, good for you. Elon goes on space to Mars and dances, dreams. Fine, whatever works for you, <laughs> remember it. Remember that shakeout falls in between. Okay, would you remember that please? Shakeout is kind of the center point of it. Okay, uh, just, you know, the way the way I would remember this, uh, the way I would remember this, I would say we have a kid here, like M is, you're a kid, right? And then uh, the kid growing up, so this is rather a baby. So you have a baby here, and then growth stage would be, you know, converting to a school kid. Okay, shakeout is like a teenager. Okay, so we have a teenager here. Mature is mature is a CFA candidate, hopefully. And decline is decline is uh, decline is 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 Donald Trump. All right, so think think of it that way. Now, uh, characteristics of each one of them. characteristics of each one of them. Uh, embryonic is when, you know, embryonic is when you're, you're starting out, customers don't know about you much. Okay, you're in the, you're in the early stage. You're selling your product expensive. There is a massive investment for you to develop the product and you might fail. Okay, so these are very, very, very early stage business. Then slowly, slowly you start growing, right? So slowly, slowly you start growing. So you get rapid growth. You're not, no one is competing with you because you're achieving economies. You can sell your products a little cheaper and you're getting profitability. Shakeout is where, uh, you know, things start slowing down a little bit. So growth slows down, competition kicks in. You might reach, you might reach over capacity. Profits will decline. Cost cutting will start. Uh, remember this: uh, weaker firms would liquidate in this phase. Then mature, uh, you know. So you're growing slow. Industry is consolidating. You know there would be three or four large players. Uh, it not. It will not be easy for new guys to come in. Uh, stable pricing, you would have market shares. And decline is when you start dying. So negative growth, declining prices and consolidation keeps on happening. Now, in terms of examples, uh, in terms of examples where, uh, like which, what kind of business, I recently came across a really, really cool business. Uh, this is not marketing of any sorts, but, but I was very impressed with these guys, uh, a business called Viziki. What they're trying to do is they're trying to do uh, the whole PR PR thing, uh, the whole pub, uh, PR thing, public relationship, but they're trying to bring in uh, data into it. Okay, they're, they're trying to bring in artificial intelligence into it. So now it's a it's a great business, but many people don't know about them yet, right? So therefore, they are a little expensive. You know, they're trying to set up their product yet. A growth stage would be where 
you know there is an acceptance right there is an acceptance so maybe how netflix was maybe and even how netflix is now or how netflix was 2 3 years ago so that that is a growth stage a shake out stage would be where things start slowing down right so the ott players now uh, there is a very strong market penetration uh, so all these guys would probably you know would start feeling the heat uh there could be industry capacity like we have tons of ott guys now in the market uh a mature would be there is a stabilization uh of the market shares so most of the fmcg companies now fall into mature stage uh and you know decline stage would be where things have start starting giving you i think tobacco would also fall into a mature stage uh, a declining industry where your you know market shares are decreasing every year on year um uh, think of some example of declining a uh, negative growth would be let's think about it i'm sure there are plenty of plenty of declining stage uh, businesses some outdated technology uh just figure out whatever okay oil is debatable but yeah uh, declining is where the size of the industry is shrinking right those those industries are typically calling declining declining industries yeah think about it i don't know declining stage industry <laughs> doordarshan no as an industry which industry is declining right as an as an industry which yeah movie rentals is fine uh, traditional telephones okay photocopying is yeah i think okay your traditional printers so a lot of a lot of traditional printer industry you know is declining shopping malls i don't know t t i don't know but anyways you you get the idea okay so you figure that out yourself and with this we're done remaining stuff is fine it's there's nothing fancy there yeah okay this is a, a small part uh, you need to know what is a cost leadership and product differentiation so uh, a cost leadership a cost leadership would be a cost leadership would be where you are the lowest cost producer in the market and a lowest cost producer you get the benefit of economies of scale a product differentiation is where you probably not the lowest cost producer but you have differentiated based on the products that you have okay and we done so congratulations it took us about 5 and a half hours with 50 60 minutes of breaks but we done so one more subject down three down seven to go so how does the how does equity look like to you feeling confident yeah do you, do you think you would be able to handle equity
everything is better than yesterday's FRA. Hmm. Good. Good to know that. Yeah, equity, you know what? In fact, for all the subjects, okay? See, I'll, I know I'm going to give you a break. I just need to tell you something which I feel is important. Now, see, the thing is, uh, for some reason, okay? For some reason, the actual CFA exam difficulty level is substantially lower than the perceived difficulty level. Okay, I, I don't know why is that, uh, but for some reason, right, people feel that. Uh, and I, I know that you must have heard from your friends. I, I must have, you must have heard from people that uh, that CFA is difficult, CFA is difficult. I, and I, I really don't know why they say that because as far as CFA level one is concerned, I would say it's a really, really easy uh, exam. There's absolutely no rocket science, even from a passing perspective, right? So if you're, if you're someone who can uh, if you can, if you're someone who can think on your feet, think on your feet means you're not, you're not the kind of a guy who's going to memorize stuff and going to say, if this is how formula is, this is how the question should be. If you're someone who can think a little bit on the exam and which you guys are, right? I mean, the fact that you're putting an effort, I'm sure that thinking gets, it's evolved. I hope you're that, uh, I like, passing through this exam is going to be easy. Okay. I don't see any difficulty whatsoever. What you guys need to do now, uh, in the last few days, which is left with you, uh, you are doing this crash course with me. The videos will remain on YouTube. You can revisit if you find them necessary. Uh, you do this, go and do a few mocks, right? Whatever you can, uh, three mocks at minimum, the more you do, the more confident you feel. And, and the CFA exam end of the chapter questions. There are about 1400 of them and don't, don't do them for the sake of finishing them. Do them because you want to learn from them. Uh, do them, you know, do them sincerely read through those, uh, 1400 questions, read, read the answers. Uh, carefully understand like what's the thinking that's going to them. Uh, you're going to get through these exams with breather. Like I, I honestly feel that, uh, you know, if you do these questions sincerely, you don't really need anything else. You're, you're going to be, you're going to be very, very comfortable with the syllabus. So now for equity, what I'm going to suggest to you. Okay. Uh, in equity, you guys did the program. You did the course with me. We spent about five and a half hours during breaks. Uh, you, if required, you can go through these videos one more time. And once this is done, directly jump onto the end of the chapter questions. Maybe today at the end of the day, jump onto those questions. Uh, go through these questions carefully. Okay. Understand, like try and solve the numericals. If it's theory, read the explanation also. Okay. Because a lot of times uh, when they write answers in the curriculum, they write this very comprehensively. They also tell you why the ones which are incorrect, why they're incorrect. So if you read through that carefully, you're done. There's really not much required beyond this. And you guys are putting in time. I don't see, I don't see any reason why you would not pass. Uh, you are going to pass, like have that at the back of your mind. And I always say this, right? I mean, you, you must have heard, heard from me a zillion times 
that focus on the process okay don't bother too much about what happens on the exam and you know what will happen with the results how are my friends preparing why people are able to do answers faster than me on chat box it doesn't matter just get your process right make sure that you are you know touching the curriculum you are well distributed uh, make sure you are practicing enough questions you are going to be all right okay enough of gyan let's take a 20 minute break after the break we start with derivatives i'm going to put on the timer
आई कैन सी चैट बॉक्स में कुछ लोग अपना सेटिंग कर रहे हैं Anyone writing in Bangalore? Yes, I am writing in Bangalore. <laughs> On what date? Twenty fifth, twenty fourth. Okay. Let's meet on twenty fifth then. Doing BSc Life Science, I want to do CFA. How difficult will it be for me? Please reply. Background doesn't matter, Yash. If you're willing to put in the time, get in touch with Fintry team. Someone will help you out. And try not to spam the chat box. Also, we'll appreciate that. am i coming to bangalore what will i do coming to bangalore so <laughs> uh, 24 25 ka to setting already ho chuka hai <laughs> mera zarurat bhi nahi hai setting karne ke liye <laughs> like, <laughs> i wonder how uh, what will i do on the day of exam this time around uh, last 8 9 years every cfa exam i've gone to the exam hall Uh, either in mumbai or in pune uh, and then i used to be like nervous the whole time uh, you know especially when people were people were writing the exams and we used to try and manage lunch for uh, some of these people at least in pune and mumbai in these two locations now this time it's going to be like a month long exam so from our perspective it's uh, Like we don't know how it's going to be, and even for you, I think it it'll be a different experience. I've written only one CBT style exam in my life for uh, CFP, where where I had to write an exam. Okay, I think I've written one more. I had written the entrance for my law school, uh, but that's it. Otherwise, all paper pencil. how is the how is the quality of audio by the way is the quality of audio video or right now guys can you confirm by chat box it seems to have frozen is the quality of audio video okay I don't think the exams are adaptive just yet. CFA exam, they're not adaptive as of now, not to my knowledge. I think they will become adaptive in a few years, but right now, no. We have couple of hours. We should be done in an hour's time.
no no i'm not a law yet i'm a law student as of now i'm not a lawyer yet <laughs> i i wanted to study so i signed up but uh, i have not been so regular i'm uh, i'm currently a second year law student and uh, i'm in a very weird i'm in a very weird college like my the college where i was uh, this year i changed my college but last year my college was my you know my college principal he was weird he he's like you have to wear uniform to the college which is uh, which is like a white shirt black trousers and shoes and and if you don't show up in your uniforms they don't let you write the exams and that that guy is really weird डॉक्टर भी मचा ट्रस्ट लो एस आई डोंट ट्रस्ट लो एस मी टू आई एग्री uh it's a it's it's a local college uh, jezel it's 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 a college in my city where where uh, attendance is attendance is like you know not strict so it's it's okay if you don't if you go once in a while that's acceptable but you have to go in your uniform so you have to be like properly dressed like a lawyer when you go to the college so yeah that's there all right derivatives derivatives all right guys uh my process is different than uh how it's in the book but now we have to do it for the exams so i'm going to be mindful of uh, mindful of that uh we are going to allocate ourselves about 1 and 1/2 to 2 hours so which means which means 6 pm india time in my watch if you see in the corner okay you might not be able to see but this is 4 pm india time right now in the next couple of hours we should be we should be done with derivatives now now here is how uh here is how i'm going to do this first we're going to do it uh asset wise so first going to start with forwards i'm going to do numbers by the way i think in derivatives uh, your questions are going to be mostly theory i don't think you would be required to do numbers okay uh, cfa level 1 if you look at curriculum end of the chapter questions everything is theory there is no numbers at all but i have also seen that 
to be able to answer those uh, number based questions confidently like the theory questions confidently you you have to have like a thought process in terms of how the numbers are derived so the idea is if you do numbers you you feel much more com- com- comfortable with doing the theory questions and i'm going to follow more or less the same process so sequence we're going to go through is forwards futures options and swaps right that's roughly the sequence we want to follow i'm going to start with forwards i'm not going to explain what derivatives is i think that's that's for school kids you guys already know what derivatives is uh, so let's jump with forwards directly okay now what is a forward it's an otc contract otc means two people sitting together you know negotiating discussing or institutions doing trade on otc for otc exchanges right over the counter now what's the risk with over the counter the risk with over the counter is default risk but but after 2008 after 2008 what happened now they brought in these counterparties called ccps centralized counterparties what centralized counterparties have tried to do they work they try to work similar to similar to a clearing house they try to work on a similar format to a clearing house and what is the benefit of that the benefit of that is they try to reduce the credit risk in the system they try to reduce the credit risk in the system okay now within forward there are two things that we want to learn one is we want to learn how to price it second we want to learn how to value it so here is the sequence that i'm going to follow in forward okay this is my big list number 1 i'm going to give you an easy question on pricing number 2 we're going to do valuation for a valuation for derivative a valuation of forward of course when we do the numerical you would automatically understand the difference between price and value uh, once you have started feeling comfortable with this then i'm going to discuss a little bit about how this would work for a commodity forward now my guess is on the exam you might end up getting question on this okay because we have to do some fancy terms associated with commodity once we have worked with commodity we are going to work on fra fra we are going to work on three parts we are going to work on price we are going to work on value but we are also going to work on synthetics price value and synthetics and once we have done these three concepts within forward forward is done and then we will jump on to the futures okay so that's the background let's start working question number 1 spot price is 100 risk free rate of return is 10% we have a maturity of maturity of 1 year what do you think would be a no arbitrage what do you think would be no arbitrage forward price what is a no arbitrage forward price come on everyone correct correct you know arbitrage forward price is forward price is equal to forward price is equal to the spot price spot price means the the current price of your underlying asset multiplied with 1 plus whatever is the interest rate raised to time period n so 100 into 1 plus 10 percentage 100 into 1 plus 10 percentage raised to 1 which is equal to 110 which is equal to 110 this is your no arbitrage forward price okay now uh i want we are going to write this inside a box okay and this 110 is my standard example even when i do the videos the reason why i'm writing it like this is i want you to appreciate that this forward price uh once you have signed the contract it does change 
agree the forward price does change the forward price of a contract can keep on changing over a period of time yes or no the forward price will keep on changing over a period of time the forward price will keep will keep on changing over a period of time come on yes or no guys the forward price will change even if i have signed the agreement it keeps on changing the price of a forward will keep on changing yes or no yes or no come on what's your answer the 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 answer is the answer is no right the forward price does not change right the, like for some reason cfa curriculum you have such theory question does the forward price change the answer is no it's constant it's signed in the agreement finish doesn't change now this is how you price a forward no oh, easy right second second let's say the same continuing with the same example after after 3 months spot price has become 125 determine what is the value determine what is the value to the long position i'm repeating it one more time calculations are not a part of cfa syllabus but if you learn this through calculations you would be able to get through theory questions very very easily right that's why we're doing it this way so after 3 months spot price is 125 what would be the value to the long position see if you can do it <laughs> pantini that <laughs> that was very smart <laughs> determine the value to the long okay guys uh, it doesn't work that way you have to think a little deeper than that okay the value thing doesn't work that way your value is not 15 it's slightly different number it works a little differently let me solve this to you uh here's how here's how you do the valuation okay please please look at this carefully uh again calculation is not in the syllabus which means if you don't learn it it's okay but if you learn it it's it's it will be very nice all right so please please look at this on a timeline on a timeline imagine you are long on the derivative and you have already agreed to buy at a price of 110 right long so i'm writing it inside a box now what happens is after 3 months the spot price after 3 months the spot price has become 125 now when you want to do a when you want to do a forward okay the way it works is you and this is my own technique uh, this technique so that you avoid the formula okay i have a technique which helps you avoid the formula uh, i call this technique as and someone in the chat box would would you help me recall this technique what is the name of the technique like we gave our technique a name right like our fintry proprietary technique uh, a technique so that you don't have to memorize the formula what is it what is the name of the technique the name of the technique is make a make a phone call make a phone call technique okay so what you do is you say okay spot price is 125 you call up the dealer you call up the dealer and you tell him sir uh, i want to enter into a new forward contract with a maturity of 9 months correct good i want to enter into a new forward contract with a maturity of 9 months can you please give me a new price and dealer says of course why not i am also a cfa student like you and i have been taught that the price of a forward contract is equal to 125 into 1 plus 
10 percentage he is using the same formula but this time he does raise to 9 by 12 okay this time he does raise to 9 by 12 why is that because only nine months left right only nine months left so when i do a new forward price let's see what do i get when i do a new forward price let's see what do i get let me fire up the calculator here and it will be 1.1 raise to bracket open 9 by 12 bracket close equal to 125 is 134.26 134.26 now this is a new price what you tell him is you tell him okay uh, if this is the new price I would like to build a short position on the new contract. Okay. Now, is this really happening? No, it's all what if scenario to help you determine what's the profit. So you tell him that, sir, I would like to build a short position on the new contract. Uh, if I do, then what happens? See this. If you, if you're able to do that, then see what happens nine months from today. Okay. Today is when today is this date. This is today, right? Nine months from today. Nine months from today, I have already signed a derivative, which is going to allow me to buy at 110, long means to buy, and I'm going to sell at 134. So how much profit will I make on that day? Not today. How much profit will I make on that day? That day I will make 24.26. Now this is my profit on expiry. I want to know the value of profit today. So how will I know the value of profit today? I have to discount this profit backwards to today. I need to bring this profit backwards to today. And how would I do it? Either use a TVM row or do it on a using a formula. So 24.26 divided by one plus 10 percentage raised to nine by 12. Calculations not important. If you're not able to do the math, that's okay. Think understand the concept because there would be some theory questions structured around it. So if you understand the concept, you would still be all right with this. Okay. So let me uh, do this quickly. 1.1 virus to X bracket open nine by 12 bracket close equal to inverse into 24.26 equal to 22.58 or 59. 22.59. This is my profit today. Okay. This is my profit today and profit or loss calculations, profit or loss is nothing but value. So when we say, when we say, what is the value? It means profit or loss. This is by the way, also called, this is also called, this is also called mark to mark, mark to market process or mark to market valuation, mark to market valuation. Okay. So uh, why mark to market? If it's an investment bank and if they have to prepare a quarterly income statement and they want to show their profits, then the amount of profits that they would want to show is 22.59 or 58. All right. That's how you value. Now, uh, does value change? So value of a, a forward contract, value for forward contract does, does, not change value of a forward contract does not change agree value of a forward contract does not change do you agree value of a forward contract does not change yes no no value for forward contract does change right for example, today it is 125, maybe in a few minutes, in a few minutes, it will become 127. And if underlying asset becomes 127, my valuation will change. If underlying asset becomes 115, my valuation will change, right? So the value will keep on changing, but price will remain constant. So for forwards, for forwards, price, price does not change for forwards price does not change value value does change value does change all right these are your first few easy ticking theory points now 
now let's make some progress with this let's go to commodities okay now in general uh, when i want to build an expression in general when i want to build an expression of a forward price okay so a forward price a forward price could be thought of as a spot price plus all the cost that i'm going to incur to carry that asset minus all the benefits that i get minus all the benefits that i get by holding the asset okay that is how you want to think of uh samir we've done raise to 9 by 12 so it's indirectly 7 and a half right but raise to 9 by 12 is the right way to do it okay so forward price is equal to spot plus all the cost minus all the benefits now what what kind of cost are we looking at right so when i'm holding an asset i incur a cost which is obviously the interest cost but can there be any other cost associated with it yes i can also have a storage cost especially for commodities because i will have to store it for a period then there are also benefits of holding the commodity now if you have a financial asset your benefit is dividend and notice what's happening okay notice what's happening you have a dividend now if you have an equity you get dividend dividend will reduce your forward price dividend will reduce your forward price remember this uh, can there be some other benefit yes if you have a bond you get coupons right coupons will reduce your forward price at cfa level 2 i will show you all these calculations including the cheapest to deliver bond now can there be some other benefit yes if you have a commodity you can give it on lease so it's called the lease yield okay if you have a commodity you can rent it out it's called the lease yield and finally finally if you have a commodity you also get some indirect benefit of holding that commodity indirect benefit of holding that commodity is called convenience yield convenience yield all right so convenience yield means uh having a having a commodity physically with me is more valuable having a commodity physically with me is more valuable than simply having a forward contract okay so that value that you derive by having the commodity with you that is called convenience yield all done okay thank you now now guys look at this uh think of it that you have a spot price of an asset of 100 okay cost of holding that asset is uh you know let us say 20 and benefit of holding that asset is uh let us say 15 can you figure out what would be the forward price can you figure out what would be the forward price forward price forward price would be 100 plus the cost 20 minus the benefit of 15 so that would be 105 can you notice that forward price is greater than the spot price correct so when forward price is greater than the spot price these type of markets are referred to as and i'm throwing a word at you and maybe some of you know that word and if you know that's a great news these type of markets are referred to as contango markets okay so this is a contango market where forward is more than the spot price okay in the same way in the same way let us say we have a spot of 100 but this time around we have a cost of 20 and we have a benefit of we have a benefit of 30 now my forward price is going to be 100 minus plus 20 minus 30 that's going to be 90 now my forward is less than the spot price look at this spot 100 forward 90 now what are these markets called these markets are called where forward price is lower than the spot price what is the word we use for them these markets we call them as backwardation these are called backwardation all right 
Now, importantly, for some very strange reason, okay, for very strange reason, your curriculum has this concept called net cost of carry. Now, intuitively, you know, as a student, when you see net cost of carry, you would be inclined to think, and I also thought the same way, that net cost of carry definition would be cost minus benefit. But how wrong I was, uh, how wrong I was to think that uh, the definition of cost of carry in your curriculum is not cost minus benefit. Net cost of carry is not cost minus benefit. In fact, the definition of net cost of carry in your curriculum is given as benefit minus the cost. Okay. The, the definition of net cost of carry in the curriculum is given as benefit minus the cost. Now, you would you'd say, Utkash, how does it matter? What difference does it make? It actually makes a lot of difference. Okay. I'll tell you how. Let us say, uh, there's a question in the curriculum which says net cost of carry, net cost of carry is positive. Okay, net cost of carry is positive. Now option A, forward would be higher than spot. Option B, forward would be lower than spot. Option C, forward is equal to spot. You tell me. Come on. So now the way you want to think of this and let me you know help you build that thought process that when net cost of carry is positive ncc net cost of carry is positive right it means benefit benefit minus cost benefit minus cost is positive that means benefit is higher than the cost that means that means we are in a backwardation market right that means this is a backwardation market and what do you mean by backwardation market it means forward price is lower than the spot price so the answers change depending on how do you perceive the definition of net cost of carry so i want you to remember this now some people are asking, why is that? I don't know. Uh, because when I saw these questions for the first time, I got all of them wrong on the cost of carry. Okay, but that's how that's how it's defined in the curriculum. So we just stick to their definition. The definition is benefit minus cost. All right, so that's how we're going to do this. Benefit minus cost. All right, moving on. Moving on. So that commodity part is done with us. I just want to spend a little more time on the concept of convenience yield so that you guys feel comfortable with that concept. Convenience yield. So, so what is convenience yield? Okay, uh, in a very practical terms, right? So think of think of this as you're an automobile company. Okay, you're an automobile company. Now you have two options. You have two options. One is you have uh, you purchase steel you purchase steel and store it okay store it or you enter into a long steel forwards a long steel forwards okay now here what is the disadvantage is an option one Disadvantage in option one, you'll have to have the storage for one entire year, like whatever time period you're holding it for. But the benefit is, you know, the benefit of this situation is in case if there is a, in case if there's a sudden surge in demand for your vehicles, right? If there's a sur sudden surge in demand, 
then you, you would prefer this option as against this option correct because if there's a sudden surge in demand you can actually use extra quantity of steel and produce and execute that so the thing is the thing is having physical commodity gives you some benefit of course there are costs i have to store it i have to worry about insurance if it's precious commodity you know i have to worry about insurance uh, i have to worry about security but benefit that i get is i get the benefit of uh, using it when required it gives me little flexibility that is referred to as convenience yield uh, if you guys have seen my videos uh, you yeah you get the chai and milk examples yeah so they work pretty well as well okay so this is also out of our way and now the next concept that i want to do is on fra now fra pricing is a little difficult but i'm still going to try and do that for you fra what does fra stands for fra stands for forward forward rate agreement forward rate agreement what is it it's a forward contract what is the underlying asset here the underlying asset here is an in i mean underlying underlying here is an interest rate or a loan so the underlying underlying here is is a loan or an interest rate okay now party which is long on fra they have a right and obligation to borrow the party which is short has right and obligation to lend the party which is long benefits when the interest rates go up party which is long benefits benefits when the interest rate go up and party which is short this benefits this benefits when interest rates interest rates go down now we use certain convention for fra so let me let me write down those convention let's say we have a fra let's say we have a 2 into 5 long fra okay so what is the meaning of what is the meaning of 2 into 5 fra come on help me out uh, meaning of 2 into 5 fra is after after 2 months after 2 months i have a right and obligation to borrow i have a right and obligation to borrow for for i am making a mistake maybe maybe i am making a mistake maybe not i have a right and obligation to borrow for 3 months correct or incorrect after 2 months for 5 years 5 months not 3 what i have written is this correct or incorrect what i have written here on the screen is this correct or incorrect the answer is correct correct so after 2 months for 3 months see the second term right the second term here 5 that's inclusive of 3 plus 2 right so you so a lot of people think it is 5 no sir it, it is 3 okay let's do one more let's do one more let's say you have short 1 into 4 fra so tell me after one month i have a right and obligation to lend or invest invest for how many months 
I have a right and obligation to invest for how many months? I have a right and obligation to invest for how many months? Take the difference of, take the difference of, of, of four minus one, you get what? You get three. So three months, All right? That's how FRS work. Understood? That's how we do. That's how we do FRS. Okay. I hope you've understood this. Now, uh, pricing FRA is very complicated. Okay. What is the price of FRA? Uh, price of a FRA is nothing but a price of a FRA is nothing but interest rate. Okay, so inside the agreement, you write down some interest rate, right? So inside the agreement, you write down some interest rate. That interest rate is your price of the FRA. So you you want to be careful there. Now, is this a random price? No. Uh, is there a logic to it? Yes. This price of the FRA is nothing but your forward rate calculation. Now, I'm not going to show you the calculation because it's because it's not worth our time here. Uh, but in fixed income class, in fixed income class, I will show you forward rate calculation. And uh, some of the Fintry students might know that we have three methods to do it. Right? We have three methods to do it. Uh, remember three methods to do forward rate. We have a logic method and we have a formula method. And then we have a, we have a, which one? There's also a third method, right? For forward rate calculations. Which one is that? Which one is that? That's the magic method. So we would be doing this tomorrow. Okay, I will be showing you all the methods. So you would be all right there. But right now I'm not getting into nitty gritties. Uh, just know, just know that uh, pricing of FRA is not a random number. Now value of FRA, value of FRA is nothing but the profit or loss that you've made profit slash law loss that you've made okay so based on the amount of profit or loss you should be able to figure out what is the value of your fra all right now what i think has a high probability of being tested on the exams for cf level one is this this whole business with synthetic frs okay i think there's a good chance this might show up synthetic frs now, how does synthetic FRA operate? Let me give you two or three examples. Uh, we will do three, three examples. I want you to, okay, we will do four. I will solve two for you. You will have to solve the remaining two. Okay, this is a high probability section. Let me also throw in some stars for them. One, two, three, three stars, good enough. Just a minute, guys. I just want to keep them next to each other so that, you know, it's a little easy for you to visualize them. So uh, let's say that we want to build first. We want to build, let us build a Let's build a two into five long FRA. Okay, I want to do a synthetic. So I have to do two things. Number one, number one, borrow for five months. Five months is 150 days. Second, invest for two months. Okay. That's my first synthetic two into five FRA. Second, uh, 
a three into five short. A three into five short. So here's what I'm going to do. Number one, invest, invest for five months. And second, borrow, borrow for three months. Three months is 90 days. All right. So these are the two examples of how to do synthetic FRS. Now you guys do it. Let me give you first one. Do one into four short and do five into two long. So give me one into four short first. Come on, give me both the answers. All right. Uh, all right, first one, one into four short. What do you do? Step number one, invest four months. Second, borrow one month five into two long come on all the smart people tell me what's the answer <laughs> it's not possible right <laughs> not possible you want the second term to be longer than the the higher than the first term so let's make this as let's make this as a four into six long four into six long then what do you do number one borrow for six months Second, invest, invest for four months. Now, is there a memory technique to this? Yes, there is an easy way to do it. How to, how to memorize this? Uh, here's your, here's your memory technique. The memory technique is, you have to remember long means borrow. Okay, so this second number, second number, and long is your step number one. So borrow for five months and then this first number goes opposite. This first number goes opposite. So then you invest. All right. Look at this three to five short. So these two are friends. These two are friends. Okay. Five and short. These two are friends. Short means what? Short means invest. Long means what? Long means borrow. So invest for five months and three goes opposite. Borrow. Again, one into four short, four and short are friends. Short means invest. So invest for four months, borrow for one month. Finally, uh, six and long, they're friends. So borrow for six months, invest for four months. Okay, if you've understood this, give me the command word for the day.
uh, Tushar they do. It's there in the curriculum as well. It, it just I'm writing it in a simple way, but it is there in the curriculum. Okay. All right. So synthetic FRA is also out of our way. Uh, more or less, we're done with forwards. Uh, see, I don't have time for reason to be honest. Uh, you know, you would want to watch. Like I've, I've kind of explained the whole rational in terms of where, where this method comes from. But, uh, but you know, we we don't really have time for this. They will simply ask you to build, they will simply ask you to build a synthetic FRA. They're like, how can we replicate, uh, how can we replicate a, a synthetic? So, you know, how can we replicate an FRA? See, in level one, they have a lot of learning outcomes and replications and synthetics. Like, how can you compare one derivative with another and all that stuff? So, if you want, if you want to do an FRA, uh, but you want to build a synthetic position, then this is how you want to do it. Uh, five months and two months. Yeah, the Babaji examples, you're right. Yeah. So the derivative videos on Fintry LMS for CFA level one, I think they are about 25 hours. So 20, I think they're 25 hours here. Yeah. So they're pretty long because, because I try to build base for CFA level two also in the level one classes. Uh, but as for now, our target is a little different, right? Now we want to pass level one. That's the focus. So this is what we need to know. All right, let's move on. Uh, FR is out of our way. Let's go to futures. Are you comfortable with my speed? future contracts. Future contracts. All right. Now, conceptually, you know, forwards and futures are kind of same, right? Now, let's say we have a long forward. Okay, let's say we have a long forward and we have a short forward. All right. Now, typically what happens is uh, there is a, typically what happens is there's a dealer in between. Okay. Uh, so there is a dealer in between and in a long forward, the, the dealer is the counterparty for both the side. So dealer takes a short position here and what dealer does is he takes a long position here. So if you'd see, if you'd see what will happen is the dealer is building long short net net is going to be zero. But when he, do, when he does that, what he would do is uh, when he's buying, he would probably buy at 99 and when he's selling, he'll, he'll sell at 101. So when he's building the short position, he will do it at 101. And when he's building the long position, he will do it at 99. And that's how he would try to earn. But the risk that the dealer has is he's exposed to credit risk of both the sides. Correct. This is typically how uh, this is typically how forward contracts operate. Now, uh, forward contracts could also be di direct. It doesn't. It is not necessary that there is always a dealer. So it can also happen. It can also happen that we have a long forward. We have a we have a short forward. All right, and these guys enter into the contract each other. This is also possible. But in case of futures, it works differently. Okay. In case of futures, what we have is we have this organization in between. What is this organization called? In case of futures, we have this organization between, which is called exchange. And within exchange, what do we have? We have a, we have a clearing house. Okay. So, when I am trying to build long position, my counterparty is the clearing house. 
And when I'm trying to build a short position, my counterparty is the clearing house. Okay. So in case of, in case of future, it is the clearing house, which is the counterparty. Now clearing house want to protect itself. So as a long, I will have to provide some sort of a security deposit. I will have to provide some sort of a security deposit. And as a short, I will again have to provide security deposit. Okay, both the parties will have to provide some sort of a security deposit. And this security deposit is called, the security deposit is called what? It is called, the security deposit is called what? It is called, come on, help me out. What do we call the security deposit? You're right. It's called the margin. Correct. It's called the margin. Okay. So it's called the margin. So what kind of margin we have? We have an initial margin. Then we have a maintenance margin. And then we have a variation margin. We have initial margin, maintenance margin, variation margin. If, if margin falls, if margin falls, if margin account falls, below be, below the maintenance margin then we have to deposit additional money we have to deposit additional margin to bring it back to bring it back to to bring it back to what level to bring it back to initial margin level and this additional money that you deposit right the additional money that you're going to deposit that additional money is called what if my margin account falls below the maintenance margin then i have to deposit more money so this additional money is called what this additional margin is called what it is called the variation margin right the incremental amount that you are supposed to deposit okay so i'm going to do a quick example for you so that the whole margin process is revised well for us again cfa level one CFA level one, no calculations, theory, theory, theory. That's it. All right. But uh, let's see. Let's see if we can do this. OK, let's assume we have some asset uh, which is priced at uh, 100. Let's say long is on the left hand side and short is on the left hand side. All right. Let's define some margin levels. Let us say initial margin is uh, 25 and let us say maintenance margin is at um, let's make it as 12. Now, uh, both the parties, their margin accounts, both the parties deposit 25 here. So it's, it's not that only one party needs to deposit long and short, both are going to deposit. Now, let us say first day, this value of 100 goes to 110. Okay. So what exchange does is it will deduct 10 rupees from the margin account of short and shorts margin account would be left with only 15. And that 10 rupees would be deposited into Long's account. The, the 10 would be deposited into Long's account. And now this margin account will become 35. Okay. Now this is uh, deducting 10 and depositing 10. This process is referred to as mark to market process. Okay. So this is what we call as M to M mark to market process, which happens every day after the market closes mark to market process so some money would be taken from this account some money is deposited into this account now what exchange will do or what broker will check broker will check whether the margin has gone below maintenance margin level okay broker will check whether it has gone to below margin level and uh, and so far, so good. So far, we don't have to worry. So far, the margin levels are all right. Agree. Now, what happened next? Let's assume next day, next day, 110 goes to, uh, let's make it, let's make it 100 and uh, let's make it 104. Sorry, 114. One month, no, 116, 116. Now, six, uh, the, you know, value of the future went up by six. 
so long is benefiting short is losing out so exchange will deduct another 6 so this will become 9 exchange will deposit 6 so this will become 41 now this is where exchange will stop and exchange will say boss your margin has gone below the maintenance margin level right your margin has gone below the maintenance margin level so please deposit otherwise i will force you to exit out of the market so please deposit how much take the take the differential amount now from 9 bring back go back to 25 from 9 go back to 25 how much do you have to deposit you have to deposit 16 incremental this 16 by the way is referred to as variation margin okay you will have to deposit 16 that's your variation margin and now your margin account is again 25 and you are ready for the next day's play okay so th this is how this is how the margin world works this is how the margin accounting happens i hope you've understood this and then this will this will keep on this will keep on happening in this particular fashion mark to market process uh very very unlikely but maybe they will ask you to do this m to m process for you know one of the side just to check whether you know you know what margin balance is left you know for example what they will do is they will throw in one more date here okay and they will say from 116 it went to let's say 111 112 now okay hypothetical now if the value has fallen now it is shorts benefit falling is benefit of the short so now exchange is going to deduct 4 from here and how much would be left with 37 and exchange is going to deduct 4 from here and how much we left with we left with 29 all right so you should be able to answer this in case if a theory question shows up it's easy you should be able to answer them with reasonable ease now i'm not going to spend spend time on differences between forward and future i'm going to assume that you guys know it okay so if you guys have understood what i'm trying to do here can you give me the today's code word all right good so futures is more or less out of our way there's just one small concept i'll have to throw at you that generally what futures do is they put a limit on there's a put they put a limit on uh how much a future price can go up you know there's a upper limit there and how much a future price can go down there's a lower limit there this is called a limit up and limit down this is done based on the risk management system of the exchange uh, to protect themselves against the uh, to protect themselves against the fluctuation in the you know margin values and uh, you know margin account values so we have this concept of limit up and limit down so this is more or less what we had to worry about futures just a comparative table now uh, let's say we have a forward let's say we have a future okay and we have price and we have value now you guys tell me uh and let me give this table a uh, two star this table is a two star now you guys tell me uh forward price does it change or does not change forward price does it change or does not change forward price change or no does not does not change does not change how about uh, how about forward value does it change value uh 
How about forward value? Does it change? Forward value. Yes, it changes. How about future price? Important question, future price. Uh, Ayman, or Ayman, sorry. I, I've been mispronouncing your name right from day one. How about future price? Does it change? Future price. No, guys, I'm talking about future price. Does it change? Future, future, future price, future price. Does it change? Future price, does it change? Future price, does it change? Sorry, I'm being repetitive. I'm just trying to grill you a little there. You'd be surprised to know. I want you to listen to this carefully. You're probably doing a theory question on this. You are going to get this right. If you get this right, it improves your probability of passing. Uh, we might get, you know, we might get good score on derivatives. Uh, it will result into you getting congratulations email. Everything depends on you listening to me for next five seconds. Does it change? The answer is yes. Future price changes because of the mark to market process. So due to the mark to market process, even the future price changes. Does the future value change? Of course, yes. So whether it changes, yes, it changes. Okay. So out of this quadrant, you want to remember that this only forward price doesn't change. Everything else changes. Chichi. You know what, some uh, random people, right, they keep on coming in and going out uh, in these live YouTube sessions. Uh, so random guys come in and go out, right? So yesterday we were doing yo-yos, today we're doing chi-chi. Uh, I've lined up, I've lined up five code words for us for the next five days, now two, you already know. So when these random guys come in, they start wondering what's happening here. <laughs> they're like, they're like, it looks like some local language. <laughs> and in these long sessions, uh, I was looking at the YouTube statistics yesterday. There are about uh, 350 of us. There are about 350 of us who are constant participants. And then, uh, you know, then there are, you know, 100, 150 people who come in and go out uh, during the session. Like there are people coming in and going out and they wonder, and I, like these guys must be wondering what's happening with the chichis here. <laughs> the one that I have decided tomorrow, that's, <laughs> you'd really like it. Tomorrow is going to be super fun. Chichi. <laughs> Uh, Joseph is asking, how does the future price change? Uh, why do the future price change? So, so the, the reason why future price changes is because you're doing mark to market settlement every day, right? So it's, it's like every day you're starting a new forward. A future is basically a daily forward. Every day you close the previous one and you start the next one. Every day you close the previous one, you start the next one. So therefore, uh, therefore it would keep on, you know, it would keep on uh, changing every day. Again, uh, you know, if you're interested, watch my more comprehensive videos, like I've covered them. Uh, I generally do an example for this. Uh, in fact, I do a, I think I do a watch example or something like that, which, which goes on for 40, 50 minutes to explain how this works. 
so you can go through it but just know that future price changes okay all right uh, options 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 i'm going to cover smaller points also later on let's just uh... oh mehir is this really your birthday uh, do you have a proof for us or you just bluffing mehir ruparel says uh, it is my birthday today okay all right mehir wish you a very happy birthday and let this year be the year when you pass cf level 1 yeah happy birthday to mehir from everyone come on all the all the 360 people who are attending live let's give him a let's give him a happy birthday everyone and i hope i hope you're not bluffing mehir i hope it's genuinely your birthday and if it is happy birthday from all of us Take a screenshot, me. options options come on everyone birthdays are done options <laughs> okay is it done can we get back to business now please let's take a 5 minute break sorry i'm little distracted 5 minutes
चल बघू आपण काहीतरी इट्स गोइंग वेल थँक्यू ओके okay. यू वॉन्ट स्टार्ट ज्यादा हो रहा है अभी प्लीज ये सब मत बोलो लेट स्टार्ट so we have call mixon can you go a little easy on and you have contingent claims so these are we have a can you confirm is it okay now are kuch kiya hi nahi redo kya karu is i think my internet is it not working um I have not connected to the new one yet. Oh, I think I have. Better. Good, 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 good. Is it going good? Hmm. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I I went back to the old one. Okay, guys. Uh. a call option no we're not doing it tomorrow we're doing it now you can have you can have either a long position so i was saying there are two types of options we have we have a long position and then we have a short position in the same way in the same way put option we have a long and we have a short position now if you are on a long position in any derivative by the way i am expecting maybe one question to show off from this flow chart all right so listen to this carefully if you are building a long position you are the one who is going to pay now in last 40 minutes come on guys uh, let's stop all the happy birthdays we will do that towards the end can we just focus on the class for a while please everyone okay it could be little distracting so long call 
you have to pay premium long put again again you have to pay premium short call short call receive premium short put short put you are going to receive premium so you are playing the premium game here so uh long call short call long put short put now one super cool trick and this trick works like a charm all right a long call is a bullish position short call is bearish a long put is a bullish position short put is oh, i did that over out a short put is a bearish position and this one is bullish so one very easy way to think of this bullish bearish bearish bullish now what do you mean by bullish you're hoping that the underlying will go up you're hoping that the underlying will go up here you're hoping that underlying will go down underlying will go down okay now maximum profit and maximum loss maximum profit and maximum loss in case of a long call option in theory your maximum profit is unlimited in case of long call option your maximum loss is premium in case of long put option your maximum profit is x minus p x is the strike rate p x is the strike rate p is the premium a lot of people think that this is unlimited that's a trap you're going to get this wrong so if you're not listening to me if you're not focused right now you're losing out one marks your competitors are going to get them you want to get this right you should be listening i know you're tired just you know last few minutes of the class please listen to this carefully the maximum profit for a long put is not unlimited it is strike minus premium one more time maximum profit for a long put is not unlimited it is strike minus the premium now maximum loss is premium so once you do once you think from the long way once you think from the long way you you just invert it for the short okay so profit of short is loss of profit of long is the loss of short which means what is the maximum profit for a short call is going to be the premium what is going to be the maximum loss unlimited right you just invert that in the same way premium and in the same way x minus p now for a call option for a call option the break even point comes at x plus p and for a put option the break even point comes at x minus p now remember that break even is same for long and short that's what break even means break even means no profit no loss right so don't don't ask me what's the break even of long what's the break even of short is the same break even point for call option is x plus the premium break even point for put option is x minus the premium you don't have to memorize this you know it's it's very easy you can do it conceptually i'm going to give you examples of course now here is what i think here's what i think might uh, happen on the exams so this is my in derivatives this is my my five star pick okay this is what i feel i feel confident that this might show up on the exam okay this is what i feel of course i could be wrong but this is my guess i'm going to give you uh five questions okay i'm going to give you five questions and in those questions you have to determine the profit or loss so what 5 now in each of the situation what i'm going to give you is i'm going to give you what was the spot price strike price uh so let me just start with the first example okay uh let's assume the 
that we here we have taken a long call position okay now spot s means the spot price so let's assume spot price is 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 100 x means the strike price so let's say strike price is uh, 70 p means the premium so let us say premium that we've paid is uh, premium that we've paid for this is let us say 20. Now, based on this information, what you have to answer for each situation is you have to answer what would be the payoff on expiry and what would be the profit. Now, payoff and profit to whom? Payoff and profit to long call. Okay, so that's your question number one. Now, you solve question number one. Uh, it's on your screen. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to set up the remaining ones. Okay, so, and when you answer, you can say A, A is the question number, and then say payoff comma profit. That could be your answer. Payoff comma profit. Let's say B, C, D, and E. So we, we are going to do a series of five questions here. Is anyone playing music in the office? Okay, you have five of these questions on your screen now. Do you want me to zoom in a little bit? Okay, you can, maybe it's not visible so well. So let me zoom the first two questions for you. You answer them one at a time. Keep on throwing the answers on the chat box, please. Guys, can you see what's happening? Hmm, good. Please keep on giving, keep on throwing your answers on the chat box. I'm waiting for them. I need a payoff and I need a profit in each of the situations.
All right, the next two questions, C and D. Yeah, you can also take a screenshot maybe because it's difficult to keep everything on the screen. Uh, C and D, can you take a screenshot? So I'll take you to the next, next uh, slide as well. And this is, this is E, take a screenshot of this as well. Okay, so now let me put all of them on one go. All right, come on, give me the answers fast. People are still on C, pick up some speed. Why is it taking so much of time? It's so easy. All right, I'm going to solve this now. Uh, I want you to observe how this is done. Okay. I'm going to get started. Observe how we do it. So with call options, uh, I'm solving the first one. Now what I want is I want you to stop doing whatever you're doing and just focus on the screen so that you understand how to think. Okay. So just stop doing what you're doing. Everyone just focus on the screen and do this with me. Every question. So long call, you will say it's a call option, right? A call option. So you're going to say, I have a right to buy. Okay. I have a right to buy at 70. Whereas price in the market is hundred. Will I buy? Yes. Because hundred worth of asset. If I get to buy at 70, will I buy? Yes. The difference of these two is your payoff. Okay, so payoff here is 30. Payoff here is going to be 30. But how much premium did you pay? You paid a premium of 20. So what's your net profit? Your net profit is 10. So 30, 10 is your answer to question number one. One was easy. Uh, anyone could have done that with reasonable ease. Let's look at question number two. Again, stop doing what you're doing, please. And please focus on how do this along with me. These are very easy questions on the exam. We don't want to miss on them. It's a long call, right to buy at 2000 strike rate means this is the rate in the agreement, right? Strike price, exercise price, right to buy at 2000 price in the market, 2,500. Will I buy? Yes. If I do what payoff do I get 500, but how much premium did I pay? I paid 650. So I, in fact, now have a loss of negative 150. So I will have a loss of negative 150. So that's my long call. Now short call. And this is where things get a little complicated. Okay. So we have to do payoff and we have to do profit. Now here's a trick. The trick is it's very difficult to think from short side. It makes things unnecessarily complicated. So don't think from short side, think from long side. 
So instead of answering for short call, answer for long call. And then what you simply do is change the sign because whatever it's a zero sum game, right? So whatever is the sign of long opposite of that is going to be short. So I'm going to solve this question question as if it's a long call and I'm going to sing the same song. I have a right to buy 200. I hope you're listening to me. I hope you're not multitasking. Uh, don't miss out on these easy points. I have a right to buy at 200 price in the market 370. Am I going to buy? Yes. Uh, what benefit do I get? What payoff do I get? I get payoff of 170, but how much premium did I pay? I paid 190. I paid a little more. My loss is 20. Now, how do you get answer for short? Just change the sign. Just change the sign. That's it. So this becomes negative 170 and this becomes plus 20. That's how you do it. Okay. Question number three. Now, question number four also, you're going to do it the same way. Payoff, profit. I hope you're listening. I hope you're not multitasking so that you don't miss out on this. The question says short put, but we are not going to think of short put. We are going to think of long put because it's easier to think of long put. So long, long, short. We're going to answer for long and then change the sign for short. All right. So let's do it together. Now, this time it's a put option. Put option means I have a right to sell. I have a right to sell at 300. Price in the market 220. Should I sell? Of course, yes. You get him to sell it at a higher price. What benefit do I get? 80. But, but how much premium did I pay? I paid 130. Did I pay extra? Of course, yes. What's the loss I have? Minus 50. So what would be the answer for short put? Just change the sign. Minus 80 plus 50. So short put is actually making a profit of 50 here. In the same way, question number question number E, again, same story. Let's think of long. Let's think of long put and we can convert our answers to short put. Okay. Payoff. Payoff means without considering premium and then profit. Considering premium. I have a right to sell at 2500. Okay. I'm thinking of long put. I'm thinking of long put. I have a right to sell at 2500. Price in the market 3000. Will I sell? Of course not. Why would I sell a 3000 asset at 2500? Will I sell? No. So then whatever premium I paid, I lost that. So that's minus 500. So for short put, zero plus 500. It's out of the money option, job done. That's how you do it. Now, those of you who have understood this and probably got them right, give me our code word for the day. Again, you know, these are easy points. You don't want to miss on them. Good. So, so with your permission, let me move on a little further now. Okay. Uh, we have American options. We have European options. We have American. I have some some content to cover yet. It's not it's not over. Please, okay. We uh, I mean, I know it's it's fun and all, but we have to we have to you know we have an exam coming our way very soon, so we have to do this properly. American, Bermudan, European. Now, what's an American option? Uh, if this is a date from purchase to expiry, date from purchase to expiry, date from purchase to expiry. If it is, if it is an American option, you can exercise. If it's an American option, you can exercise at any point of time. You can exercise at any point of time. If it's a European option, you can exercise 
you can exercise only on the final day only on the expiry if it's a bomodon option if it's a bomodon option you can exercise on few specified dates in between and on the final day okay so know the difference between know the difference between american options bomodon options european options american option on the la any part of time bomodon some dates in between european only on the final day right uh, moving on moving on now we have something called as uh, itm options itm options atm options otm options in the money at the money out of the money how do how do they work very simple uh, let me give you a few examples i'm going to give you a few examples you have to do match the following type of thing okay let's do match the following type of exercise just a minute all right come on see i know i know you're feeling tired right uh <clears throat> so uh li listen to this very carefully okay just 2 minutes here i recently uh recently learned to uh, lift weights okay so all my workouts prior i was i was all out and cardio person uh, and body weight i never really did uh, weight lifting i'm just i'm still learning and i'm really enjoying it and one of the thing that i one of the thing that i did learn okay and i hope you're listening to me one of the thing that i did learn is uh, when you weight lifting right uh when you uh, you do you do repetitions so you let let's say you're doing you know your chest press or you're doing your uh, bicep curls or whatever so when you do the 10th repetition is going very slowly right you're doing it easily so 10th rep 11th rep then it comes to a point where your body starts saying don't do it okay you reach to a point where your body is saying uh, please stop don't do it it's hurting you now it's troubling you right that lactic acid starts burning and then the next two three reps that you do after that are the reps that really bring in big change in your life right so there is always uh, a little trouble a little discomfort zone uh, before the success so i know you guys are tired i am tired too okay but we have to make this happen for ourselves you have been you have been so patient the whole day haven't you right from morning this is about 5:40 uh, you've done really good okay and i'm proud of each one of you for being so uh, i'm proud of you guys for being so patient throughout the day going through this entire syllabus so let's make it happen for you i need maybe 30 44 minutes uh, be patient let's do this systematically right everyone and this will bring a results and i think this is your competitive advantage compared to compared to the rest of the world this is what is differentiating you from rest of the cfa candidates you have that grit in you to sit through the whole process okay so let's make it happen this is a time for us to eat the maximum benefits so let's do that okay so now in the money let's let's do example number 1 okay let's say we have 
let's say we have a strike price of a strike price of 100 a spot price of 150 uh, a premium of 40 it's a, a premium of 40 it's a call option you tell me you tell me is it is it in the money at the money out of the money what do you say in the money at the money out of the money what do you say so in order to determine whether an option is in the money or out of the money premiums don't matter this doesn't matter okay this is irrelevant what what matters is simply i have a right to buy at 100 price in the market 150 will i buy of course yes every time the answer comes yes we say option is in the money okay if the answer is yes option is in the money when the answer is no option is out of the money all right let's look at one one let's say we have a call option strike price of 100 spot price of 70. now tell me i have a right to buy at 100 price in the market 70. will you buy will you buy i have a right to buy at 100 price in the market 70. will you buy now no right doesn't make sense why would you buy a 70 worth of asset at 100 we call this as out of the money when strike price is same as spot price, and let's make this a put option, doesn't matter. When these two are same, it's at the money. When these two are same, at the money. Next one. Okay, next one. One more. Let's say, let's say we have a put option, strike price of 200, spot price of 160. Now here, I have a right to sell. Put option is about selling, right? I have a right to sell at 200. Price in the market 160. Will I sell? Yes. Answer is coming out to be yes. It is in the money. Every time answer comes, it is in the money. Okay. I hope this is making sense. Let's do one more put option. One more put option. I have a right to sell at uh, 300. Price in the market 250. I have a right to sell at 300 price in the market 250 will i sell will i sell yes yes of course why not right i will sell because i'm i'm getting to sell at a higher price so this becomes in the money so that's how you determine whether an option is in the money uh, whether an option is at the money whether an option is out of the money okay so i'm going to assume you're comfortable with this now uh, next concept I'm building some momentum an options premium okay an option premium is same as the value of the option which is same as the price of the option okay these terms are used interchangeably the same now an options premium is made of two parts it is made of intrinsic value it is made of intrinsic value mass yes uh, or intrinsic value and time value now this time value is also called the speculative value of the option okay time value is also called the speculative value of the option all right now uh, I'm going to give you a few options. Uh, I'm going to give you a few questions. I want you to learn to break them down into uh, the two parts. Okay. Let us say we have a, we'll start with a call option first. Let's say we have a call option. Uh, we have a strike price of 100. We have a spot price of 140. And, and we have a premium of 60. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take this premium and break it down into two parts. How much is the intrinsic value? How much is the intrinsic value? And how much is the time value? So how are you going to do this? You're going to say, I have a right to buy at 100. Price in the market 140. Will I buy? Yes. Uh, it's an in the money option. And 
if I do, what payoff do I get? I get 40. So that's my intrinsic value of the option. But how much I'm willing to pay? I'm willing to pay 60 for this option. How much extra I'm paying? 20. That's my time value. Okay, let's do one more. Let's do one more. Let's say, uh, let's say strike price is 200 and spot price is, uh, spot price is uh, 150 and premium, premium is 40 and we have a put option here. Okay. Now tell me how much of this 40 for a put option is intrinsic value and how much of this is time value. How much of this is intrinsic value? How much of this is time value? How much of this is intrinsic value? How much of this is time value? So now you say, I have a right to sell at 200 price in the market is 150. Will I sell? Yes. It's an in the money option. Intrinsic value is 50. Intrinsic value is 50, but it's kind of strange, right? It's strange that time value is coming out to be minus 10 in order to make this 40 work. Is this possible guys? Is this possible? Can this happen? Can we have a time value negative? Is this possible? Is this possible that is this possible that we will have a negative time value? What do you think? Is this possible? Can we have a negative time value? The answer is yes, it is possible. We can have a negative time value with what type of options? Generally with European puts. Generally with European puts. Okay. Especially the ones which are in the money. So if you have a, a deep in the money European put, yes, it is possible. A deep in the money European put, yes, it is possible that we can have uh, we can have a negative time value. Intrinsic value is never negative. Intrinsic value is never negative. Okay, but the time value can be negative. All right, moving on. Next one. Next one, last one now, uh, strike price 200, spot price. Now this is my pick for your exam again. I think, I think, you know, uh, this is a probable question. Like this is just my guess. Uh, let's say spot price is, is uh, 230, premium is 40. It's a put option. Break down this 40 into two parts. How much is intrinsic value? How much is time value? Jay, you'll have to watch my main videos to understand why it happens. Uh, it's not so easy. The arbitrage that you're talking about, it doesn't work that way. There's a reason why it's negative. It's, it's not a random thing. Okay, so intrinsic value is zero because it's an out of the money option. It's an OTM option. You do not have negative intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is zero. The entire premium of the option is the time value. Right. So maybe on the exam, what they will say is they will ask you something like what percentage of premium is, is composed of time value. What percentage of premium is composed of time value. And the answer is 
boss my time value is 40 my premium is 40 it is 100 percent what percentage of premium is composed of time value the answer is 100 percent remember time value is also called the speculative value of the option okay now i'm building momentum there are six variables six variables that determine six variables that determine an option value or option premium the six variables are spot price strike price volatility in the market time to maturity time to maturity spot strike volatility time rfr and dividend okay these are the six variables that determine uh, that kind of influence the price now we are going to build a table this table is also there in your juice notes where we are going to see uh, what happens what happens if the spot is higher strike is higher wall is higher time is higher rfr is higher and dividend goes up what impact will it have what impact will it have on the call and the put prices okay so please everyone when spot price goes up uh, what happens to call option uh, you can give me just up or down so you can just press u or t okay spot price goes up what happens to call option call option goes 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 up when strike price is higher the value of call option when the strike price is higher the value of call option is lower when the volatility goes up call option goes up when the time to maturity goes up call option goes up when rfr goes up call option goes up when dividend goes up call option goes down put spot price is higher call put option lower strike price higher put option higher volatility higher uh, put option higher time higher rfr lower dividend higher you have to know this table you have to know this table well three stars testable please make sure you know this table well okay uh, if if you feel that you're not comfortable take a screenshot put this on your wall think through it remember it do whatever you need to do make sure you understand this well all right moving on okay building momentum next concept in the line is put call parity there are a lot of there's a lot of content in the syllabus on options we have to do that so put call parity now let's say the first the formula there's an easy way to remember the formula sip pepsi be cool guys focus focus if you have doubts if you have queries either go and watch the original videos or put them in the comments after the video gets live we will try and answer them for you okay right now just focus uh put call parity here's your memory technique sip pepsi be cool now what do you mean by sip pepsi be cool what is this stupid thing here that stupid thing is here to help you memorize a formula s p b c stop plus put is equal to bond plus call stop plus put is equal to bond plus call this is called the protective this is called the protective put this is called the fiduciary call okay now put call parity works on what type of options put call parity works on only on european options okay you can't run this on american options there's a different version of it that works on american uh, this works on european options s plus p is equal to b plus c s stands for stock p stands for a put option b is a bond it's a zero coupon bond it's a zero coupon bond the strike price and the face value has to be same and this is a call option now now let's see let's see how the maths work here i'm going to give you one example again put call parity i'm going to give it a star i know i'm giving too many stars because these are all probables for me okay from a question writer perspective if i put myself in the shoe of someone who's 
you know, writing the questions. I, these are juicy areas. I would want to write questions on them. All right, let's see. Let's say we have a stock at trading at 200 rupees or 200 Indian rupees. Now we have a call option, which has a strike price of strike price of let's say 150. And the call option is trading at a premium. Call option is trading at a premium of 90. Risk-free rate of return is 10 percentage. Expiry is one year. Based on this information, you have to figure out what should be the premium of what should be the premium of put option. Start. Okay, so I'm going to solve this for you. See how, how this is done. So just set up your basic equation. S plus P is equal to B plus C. Now what's your stock price here, right? Just do fill in the blanks. It's like, it's like you know, how a school kid would do it. So stock price 200. P is your put option. We don't know the put options. We need to figure that out. If you make a mistake on this, you probably make a mistake with bond because what people would do is, they will get the bond thing wrong. This bond is, and I remember this place, this bond is nothing but present value of strike price. Okay, will you remember this for me, please? Bond is nothing but present value of strike price. So, so the way you want to do bond is figure out what the strike price is. It's 150. 150 divided by 1 plus. 150 divided by 1 plus. 10 percentage for RFR. So 10 percentage raised to 1. Plus, what's the call option? Call option, call option, call option is how much? It is worth 90. Call option premium is 90. That's it. That's how easy it is. Okay. So what should be the what should be the value of your put option? The value of your put option should be 150 divided by 1 plus 10 percentage raised to 1 plus 90 minus 200. How much is this coming to? About 25 is 26.36. If you got this right, you know what to do.
good so put call parity is out of our way uh next is binomial tree okay i'm sorry it's it just yeah, there are so many small 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 things binomial tree binomial tree uh, of auction pricing or binomial model of auction pricing it works on one assumption uh that assumption is very important that assumption is uh, that assumption is that assumption is that assumption is risk neutrality okay so a lot of derivative pricing happens on the assumption of risk neutrality now what do you really mean by risk neutrality you assume that investor investor wants to earn rfr from all assets he's a risk neutral he doesn't care so he wants to earn rfr from all assets investor wants to earn rfr from all assets that's it you know that's what a risk neutral probability is or risk neutrality is now binomial tree calculation is not there in your syllabus but there could be theory questions and therefore i'm going to do one question for you okay uh there's no harm in learning how to do this so let's see how the calculation works here let's assume we have you know spot price is zero we have rfr of uh, 10% you would probably be given a u on the uh, you probably be given a u on the exams let's say uh, you know let me make that number to be 1.25 and uh, a strike price of call option would be given let's say a strike price of call option i'm making it as 80 okay and then we will have to do let's say a, a single period a single period binomial tree a single period binomial tree for valuation of this call option for valuation of this call option now the way you want to do this is step number 1 is you want to calculate the risk neutral probability which probability risk neutral probability which probability risk neutral probability why am i repeating this like an idiot because i want you to listen to these words remember these words uh, there could be theory questions testing you on whether you know or not but that the probability that we use is risk neutral what does it mean it means we are working with some sort of an investor who's okay with earning rfr okay so risk neutral probability what formula do we use 1 plus r minus d divided by u minus d what is this u minus d uh, what is this u u is the size of uptick what is it d d is an inverse of u so 1 divided by 1.25 1 divided by 1.25 is what number it is 0.8 okay so how let's calculate risk neutral probability 1 plus 10 percentage minus 0.8 inverse of 1.25 divided by 1.25 minus 0.8 when i do the math i will get 66.67 percentage what is the meaning of that 66.67 percentage there is a probability that the stock price goes up by 66 there is a probability that the stock price goes up what is the chance that the stock price goes up 66.67 percentage okay u is called the uptick d is called the downtick and this number is called risk neutral probability now once you know this what do you need to do you need to build your tree how does your tree look like you're probably not doing the calculation but i want you to like just see the process once so that you can do the theory questions so your stock price is 100 now the 100 can go up it can go down if it goes up it goes up by a factor of u so it is if it goes up it was a band factor of u so this is 1.25 if it goes down it goes down by a factor of d so that's 0.8 so this is 125 and this is 80 this is my stock price in one year stock price in one year all right now i want to figure out the value of my call option then now what call option i'm dealing with a call option which has a strike price of 80 so strike price of 80 so you start singing your favorite song you say i have a right 
to buy at 80. Price in the market 125. So will I buy? Yes, I will get 45. I have a right to buy at 80. Price in the market 80. Will I buy? It doesn't matter. I have the money option value zero. So one year from now, my option is either worth 45 or it is worth zero. Probability that it goes up is 66.67. We just calculated goes down 33.33. So one year from now, an average probability of my stock, uh, average value of my stock is 45 into 66.67 plus plus zero into 33.33. And this is a price one year from now. I want to discount it backwards to today so that I get today's valuation divided by 1.1. So I'm going to quickly pull this off. Actually, it should be about 27. This should be 30, right? Uh, two by three. So yeah, it should be about 27-ish. Can you please confirm if this is correct? 27 point something. Okay. Uh, have you guys understood this? I don't think you have to do calculations based on how the learning outcomes are being worded. You have to just understand the process, be able to do the theory questions. Uh, there's no offense in memorizing this formula, the risk neutral probability formula. Okay, so just remember that. All right, uh, we've covered good ground on options. We've covered a good ground on options. I need to do a little bit of swaps with you. Okay. Uh, what do we need to cover in swaps? At basic, we have a swap is, and at basic, we have a very minimum interest rate swap. Now, an interest rate swap, there are two parties. I'm sorry, I'm just going with the momentum. Okay, I want to uh, I want to cover some th more theory theory points for you. Okay, so let's just let's just keep on building the momentum. Uh, we have an interest rate swap. Uh, what happens in a what happens in an interest rate swap? We have two parties. We have a party that pays fixed, okay, and receives floating. Now this party is generally called, this party is generally called a pair in the SOP. Okay. So when we say pair in the SOP world, we generally refer it to in the context of the fixed rate. In the same way, we also have a party that will, we have a party that will receive fix the opposite party. Okay. Receive fixed and receive fix and pay floating floating means the rate that's that keeps on changing typically LIBOR but of course we know that LIBOR is getting replaced very soon right I hope you guys know it we already have software coming in very soon LIBOR would be at least that's what they are trying so this type of SOP is referred to as a receiver SOP so in a SOP we have two parties we have a payer party we have a receiver party okay what kind of a SOP are we talking about here we're talking about an interest rate SOP now I'm going to do one example uh, what I want to do is I want to show you how the cash flows of the SOP work. Okay, so we are working on the cash flows of the SOP. Now a SOP will have a notional principle. A SOP will have a notional principle. So uh, a SOP will have a notional principle. Let's say a notional principle of uh, let me make up a number 100 million. Now, first theory question in an interest rate swap, this notional principle is not exchanged. Uh, it could be a little bit of both, uh, Anand, but again, you know, let's not get into that. Uh, in an interest rate swap, this will 
this will not be exchanged. Okay, this is not exchanged. It's just there in the agreement. Now, uh, now this is not exchanged, but and in general, notional principle are not exchanged. But there is one exception to this rule. There is one swap where we do exchange notional principle. Uh, can you guys tell me what that exception is? Can you guys uh, tell me what exception is? Yes, you're right. It is the currency swap. So in a currency swap, notional principle are exchanged. Otherwise, all of the swaps, notional principles are not exchanged. Okay. So remember that. Now, Manav, great job, man. Good. Now, uh, a swap will have a price. What is the price of the swap? Let's say 8%. So when we say price of a swap, it, it is nothing but a fixed rate. Uh, it will have a maturity. Let's, let's have maturity of uh, three years. Okay. And, and it will have a frequency of reset or frequency of payment. And let's say, let's make this an annual swap. So as I told you, there are two, there are two parties in our swap. This is party number one. We're going to call this as the pair. When I say pair, do I mean a fixed pair or floating player? I told you swap is always in the context of on in the context of fixed, right? So fixed pair. And then we have the other guy who's the receiver. So for next three year, for next three years, the way cash flows of the swap work is like this. The payer is going to pay to the receiver every year. How much? The fixed rate. How much is that? 100 into 8 percentage. So he's going to pay him 8 mil. 8 mil, 8 mils, 8 mils. Okay. And every year, receiver will also have to pay him something, right? Receiver will also have to pay him something. So how much will receiver pay him? So every year receiver will have to pay him something. Now that is a function of what is the floating rate and what is the spread. Okay. Now let's not make it too complicated. Let's just have a zero spread. So let's assume we have year zero, year one, year two, year three. And let's say we are looking at a one year LIBOR. Okay. For simplicity purposes, one year LIBOR. So let's say one year LIBOR at time zero was 10%, let's say this is 11%, let's say this was, uh, you know, let's say this was uh, uh, 6% and let's say this was 9%, okay? So the trick is, and this is where a lot of people will get this wrong. So I want you to listen to this. This is year one, agree? This is year one. This is year one, this is year two, this is year three. For to determine the payment of year one, to determine what payment would be made in year one, you have to choose the rate of time zero. Okay. And I know it's a little counterintuitive. The logic for this is 10% existed in this window. 11 would be in next year's window. So therefore, the payment that would be made here would be at 10 mils. So there would be a netting. You pay me eight, I pay you 10. Let's just close it to two in the first year. I hope you're understanding this in the same way, in the same way, the payment that would be made in year two would be one year rate. You always take a rate in advance, like a one period earlier rate. So the payment that would be made here would be 11 mils, 11 mils. And in the final year, in the final year, the payment that would be made would be six mils. The second year rate for third year payment, one period earlier, you're right. So payment that would be made here would be six mils and that's it. That's how, that's how you want to do the cash flows for swaps. All right. Uh, is notional principle exchange? No, notional principles will not be exchanged. Is this okay? Are you guys comfortable with this?
good so i think we've covered we've covered most of the ground uh, there are some finer points left uh, but again you know i'll recommend that uh, as far as exams is concerned you know we we are decent we are at a comfortable level the remaining stuff uh, you can go through the juice notes and practice a few questions so just give me a minute i needed to give you some sort of a to do for for today now today we are saving time right so i want you to make make good use of this time today so so if you have if you do have time if you do have time is your to do list for the rest of the day right or before before we do tomorrow morning now i've tried to optimize as, as much time as we could within the you know window that we have now use the curriculum so first is you revise these notes again okay these notes uh, should be available in the video description uh, should be available in a uh, should be available in what you said 20 30 so youtube takes a little time to process the video uh youtube takes some time to process the video but uh, about 30 40 minutes these notes would be available so revise these notes uh read through the juice notes if you can okay if you have access to the juice notes you would benefit with them immensely uh we have slashed prices of these juice notes significantly they they are available at a very low price on the printry site or if you want a printed version on amazon so you can go through them uh, juice notes has a good coverage on all these points second and this is important please use curriculum end of the chapter questions okay eoc questions especially for especially for equity and derivatives uh, especially for equity theory areas okay all the theory areas that we were doing today and derivatives it's a must if you're not doing curriculum end of the chapter questions you're not going to feel confident on the exams okay because some of the questions right they really abstract for example what is the definition of arbitrage what do you mean by replication and you know they, they, they this is something that you have to memorize that okay what this is what the curriculum author wants to say this is the sentence is used this is what i'm going to memorize so it's important that you do curriculum end of the chapter questions now while you do them try and do them horizontally okay so horizontally is keep keep your books open both the both the equity and sub so let's say you have you know equity you have six readings right so you have reading number 1 reading number 2 reading number 3 reading number 4 your derivatives reading number 1 whatever now i told you the other day uh, pick up two or three random questions 2 3 and 5 and then do question number 2 3 and 5 from all the readings okay why do i recommend this it forces you to do multiple concepts at the same time like how actual exams are actual exams are never like this that once you do derivatives you keep on doing uh, you know the same reading sequentially in exams you will have to mix different concepts together so when you revise them horizontally it teaches it trains your brain to do it that way okay so please uh, try and do uh these questions horizontally and finally the the last thing that you i want you to do and just wait a minute i'll have to get this thing live just a minute all right so the last thing that you have to do is ah that's visible huh the last thing you have to do is please like the video uh this one and even the last one in case if you have already haven't uh and comment on them or whatever you want to comment now i don't know what you would comment uh but whatever you want to comment i think that helps uh, because it kind of spreads we've been trying to hit uh, 100000 subscribers we've been struggling
for the last few months. So see if you can do it. That will help us a lot. All right, so that's it from my side. I hope you enjoyed the session today, because I did. So, stay positive, you're going to pass. Please stay positive, you are going to pass. You are on the right track. I can see you moving in the same, you, I can see you moving in the right direction. These last few days are, you know, as much studies, as much as the psychology management, like having the right temperament and you guys are doing all the steps right. Uh, I've told you this before that if you get your process right, right? If you, if you do your process right, uh, results are inconsequential. Like what matters is, uh, am I giving 100% of what I have inside me uh, because it matters to me? Uh, in Hindi, like if I could use Hindi, I would say, Sharir ka hare kan. Every small atom of your body, every small part of your body it needs to have that desire that I'm going to make this happen for myself. And you guys are doing it. And I'm proud of you for that. I know that sitting through such long sessions is not easy, but you did this. So thank you very much. And I will see you now tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, Fixed Income and Ethics.